Introduction to The Spiritual Combat This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roman Pallone The Spiritual Combat by Lorenzo Scapoli Introduction The earnestness of the religious revival in the south of Europe in the 16th century was commenced soon after the great schism of the church, and is well illustrated by this marvelous work of Lorenzo Scapoli, a Theatine clerk regular. This religious order was founded in 1524 by Caetan, or Gaetan, of Tien, afterwards canonized, and Carafa, bishop of Theat, whose diocese gave its name to the new congregation. Its great object was the same as that of the original followers of John Wesley, namely to supply the deficiencies of the parochial clergy. No religious missionaries ever preached with greater power or made more converts, not in churches but in public places, wherever large numbers could be got together. The members of the New Brotherhood were deterred by no difficulties and were fearless in all dangers. The outcast, dying of the most loathsome disease, received from them the last consolations of the church. One of the foremost in zeal and devotion was John Pietro Carafa, afterwards Pope Paul IV, whose fervor was as conspicuous on the papal throne as in founding the new order. It was from the convent of the Theatines at Venice that Ignatius Loyola set out for Rome to form the Society of Jesus. All that is really known of the life of Scapoli, after his admission into the Theatine Order, is contained in the notice prefixed to the Italian. After many years of the active duties of his calling, during which he had won a great name as a preacher in most of the large towns in Italy, he retired into strict seclusion in which he remained for twenty-five years, until his death. This withdrawal from active life, in consequence of some calumny, the nature of which has not come down to us, was destined to produce a work to have a world-wide influence. The fruit of this seclusion was The Spiritual Combat, which first appeared with the title By a Servant of God, and afterwards as simply by a Theatine the author concealing his individuality and wishing the work to appear as the teaching of the order to which he belonged. This proceeding, so natural with such a disposition as that of the deviser of these practical rules for a holy and religious life, has given rise to a dispute almost as voluminous as that about the authorship of The Imitation of Christ. The spiritual combat has been claimed both by Benedictines and the Jesuits. But the testimony of St. Francis de Sales and other contemporaries clearly shows it to be the production of the Theatines, and the members of the latter order are unanimous in referring it to Scapoli as the sole author. In the Pilgrim's Progress, the Christian is represented as a traveler to the heavenly kingdom, beset by dangers and snares. In the spiritual combat, he is shown throughout as a soldier, putting on the armor of righteousness, and fighting with great weapons of faith and endurance against all the powers of spiritual evil. The book is in fact a manual of exercises for the soldiers of Christ. Scapoli did not make his profession until about the age of forty, and knew the temptations of the world from experience. It is not therefore surprising to find how practical and concise the rules are. Good examples of this will be found in the chapters on the exercise of the will, how to combat sloth, and in the advice on how to resist sensual impulses. How useless it is as a safeguard to dwell on the vileness of vice, its insatiable craving, the bitterness and loathing, the peril and ruin of a state, life, and honor, which follow in its train. The bitter experience of millions will testify. 
to fly to the cross is the only sure way of safety. In the present edition, the original Italian has been followed, and it is hoped this admirable work is presented throughout in an acceptable form to the English reader. End of introduction. Chapter 1 of The Spiritual Combat. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roman Pallone. The Spiritual Combat by Lorenzo Scapoli. Chapter 1. In what Christian perfection consists, we must fight in order to attain it of the four things necessary. Dost thou seek, beloved in Christ, to attain to the highest point of perfection, and by approaching ever nearer and nearer to thy God, to become one spirit with him? The enterprise thou undertakest is the greatest and most noble which can be imagined or expressed. But thou hast first to learn what constitutes the true and perfect spiritual life. Many have made it to consist exclusively in austerities, in wearing down the flesh, in hair shirts and disciplines, in long vigils and fasts, and the like bodily sufferings and chastisements. Some, especially women, think they have made great progress when they say many prayers, hear many long services, and frequent churches and communions. Others, again, among whom may be found not a few who wear the religious habit and dwell in the cloister, are persuaded that perfection depends entirely on punctual attendance in the choir, on silence, solitude, and exact observance of rule. And thus some hold perfection to consist in these, some in other actions of a like kind. This, however, is by no means the truth, for although the above-mentioned works are sometimes the means of obtaining increase of grace, and are sometimes the fruits thereof, yet it cannot be said that in these alone can consist Christian perfection and the true life of the Spirit. They are doubtless most effectual means of obtaining increase of the Spirit in the hands of those who who use them well and discreetly, of acquiring new strength and vigor in the conflict with their own sinfulness and frailty, to arm them against the assaults and snares of our common enemies, and to furnish them with those spiritual aids so needful to all the servants of God, and more especially to those who have but lately entered upon His service. Again, they are the fruits of the Spirit only in spiritual persons, who chastise the body because it has offended its Creator, and in order to keep it humble and submissive in His service, who keep silence and live in solitude, that their conversation may be in heaven, and that they may avoid the slightest offense against the Lord, who give themselves entirely to divine worship, and all offices of piety, who pray and meditate upon the life and passion of our Lord, not for the sake of devotional feeling or curiosity, but that they may know more and more deeply their own sinfulness, and God's goodness and mercy may be inflamed more and more with the love of God and the hatred of self following the Son of God by denying themselves and taking up the cross, who frequent the most holy sacraments to the glory of His divine majesty, that they may be more closely united with God and may gain fresh strength to resist their enemies. To others, however, who build upon these alone, such outward works may sometimes, not from any fault in themselves, for they are very good, but from the mistaken use made of them, become a more certain occasion of ruin than open sins, 
because wrapped up in these actions only, such persons leave their hearts a prey to their own inclinations and to the secret wiles of the devil. Satan, seeing them already out of the right path, not only suffers them to pursue these exercises with satisfaction, but lets their vain fancy roam up and down amid the delights of paradise, where they imagine that they are borne aloft, even to the angelic choirs, and that they feel God within them. At times, also these persons find themselves wholly taken up out of themselves, in high, mysterious, and impassioned meditations, so that, oblivious as it were of the world and all creatures, they deem themselves caught up into the third heaven. But how far these men are from the perfection which we are seeking, and how many and grievous errors they are entangled, may be easily gathered from their life and conversation. For in all things, little as well as great, they desire to have the preference and advantage over others. They worship their own wisdom and are self-opinionated. Whilst blind to their own faults, they observe busily and judge harshly the sayings and doings of others. But touch them, however gently, on the vain estimation in which they hold themselves, and delight to be held by others, bid them lay aside any of their formal and regular services, forthwith they are filled with indignation, and are beyond measure disconcerted. And if God, in order to bring them to a true knowledge of themselves and of the way of perfection, visits them with trials or infirmities, or permits persecutions to overtake them, which are the touchstones of his servant's loyalty, and never come upon them but by his command and with his permission, then is discovered the insecure foundation on which their spiritual house rests, and the miserable condition of the interior laid bare, for they will not resign themselves to God's will, nor humble themselves under his hand, acquiescing in his ever just, though hidden, judgments, in all circumstances which may befall them, joyful or sorrowful, Neither will they, after the pattern of his only begotten Son, in his humiliation and suffering, abase themselves below all creatures, counting their persecutors as dear friends, as instruments of divine mercy, working together for their mortification, perfection, and salvation. Hence is it a thing most certain that such persons stand in the greatest danger. For having their inward eye darkened, and therewith contemplating self, and these their outward works in themselves good, they attribute to themselves a high degree of perfection. And thus becoming more and more puffed up, they judge others, while their own conversion unless God vouchsafe them to them a special need of grace, is well nigh hopeless. For this reason, the open sinner may be more easily converted and brought back than he who is veiled and hidden from himself by the semblance of virtue. Thou seest then plainly enough, as I have now made plain to thee, that the essence of the spiritual life consists not in these things. The spiritual life consists in nothing else than the knowledge of the goodness and greatness of God and our own nothingness and proneness to all evil in the love of Him and hatred of ourselves, in submitting ourselves not to Him alone, but for love of him to every creature, in entirely renouncing our own will 
and absolutely resigning ourselves to his divine good pleasure, and moreover, doing and willing all these things simply to glorify God and solely to please him, because such is his will and because he deserves so to be loved and served. This is the law of love imprinted by the hand of the Lord himself on the hearts of his faithful servants. This is the self-denial which he requires of us. This is his easy yoke and light burden. This is the obedience to which our Redeemer and Master calls us, both by his voice and example. And because in aspiring to such a height of perfection, thou must needs do continual violence to thyself in order to fight manfully and destroy thine own will in all things, little or great. Therefore shouldst thou prepare thee for this conflict with all readiness, knowing that they only who fight bravely shall receive the crown. Inasmuch, then, as this is, of all conflicts, the hardest, for while we are fighting against ourselves, we are striven against by ourselves, so shall the victory, when obtained, be of all others the most glorious and the most dear in the sight of God. For if thou can succeed in trampling underfoot and destroying all thine inordinate affections, desires, and wishes, even the slightest of them, thou will render a more acceptable service to God than if thou should scourge thyself unto blood, or should fast more rigorously than hermits and anchorites of old, or convert millions of souls and yet willingly suffer one rebel will to remain unmortified. The conversion of souls is doubtless in itself more precious to the Lord than the mortification of a slight desire. Nevertheless, thy part is to will and to do that first and chiefly, which the Lord specially wills and requires of thee and he will undoubtedly be better pleased that thou should watch and strive to mortify thy passions than if knowingly and willfully, leaving even one alive within thee, thou should zealously serve him in some other direction, though of greater dignity and importance. Now that thou see wherein real Christian perfection consists, and that in order to obtain it, thou hast to undertake a constant and unrelenting warfare against thyself, thou must provide thee with four things as most sure and necessary weapons by which to win the palm and finally secure the victory in this spiritual combat. These are distrust of self, trust in God, spiritual exercises, and prayer. Of all which we shall, with God's help, treat briefly and plainly. End of chapter 1. Chapter 2 of The Spiritual Combat. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roman Pallone. The Spiritual Combat by Lorenzo Scapoli. Chapter 2 of Distrust of Self. In this conflict so necessary to thee is distrust of self, that unless thou be furnished with it, you will assuredly be unable not only to gain the victory, but even to overcome the very weakest of your passions. 
and let this be well impressed on your mind, inasmuch as our corrupt nature too easily disposes us to a false estimate of ourselves, so that while we are in reality absolutely nothing, we flatter ourselves that we are something, and without the slightest foundation presume vainly on our own strength. This is a defect not easily discerned by ourselves, but one which is very displeasing in the sight of God. For he loves and desires us to acknowledge truly and heartily this most certain truth, that all grace and virtue in us is derived from him alone, the source of all good, and that from ourselves can proceed nothing, no, not even a good thought, which may be worthy of his approval. And although this very distrust of self, which is most necessary, is itself the work of his divine hand, who is wont to bestow it upon his beloved, sometimes by means of holy inspiration, or again by sharp chastisements, by violent and almost irresistible temptations, or by other ways incomprehensible to us, yet it is his will that we, on our part, should do our part. I will therefore lay before the four means by which, relying above all things on the aid of the grace of God, such distrust of self may be acquired. The first is to meditate on and know your own vileness and nothingness, how of yourself you can do nothing good whereby to merit an entrance into the kingdom of heaven. The second is to implore the Lord for it, with fervent and humble prayer, for it is his gift. And in order to attain it, you must first regard yourself as not only wholly destitute of it, but as utterly powerless of yourself to gain it. Therefore present yourself again and again before the divine majesty, with an assured faith that he is willing of his great goodness to grant your petition. Endure the delay however long which his providence appoints, and without any doubt you shall obtain it. The third is to live in continual fear of yourself, of your own judgment, your strong inclination to sin, the numberless enemies against whom you are of yourself utterly powerless, their long practice in war, their wiles, their transformation into angels of light, and the innumerable arts and snares wherewith, in the very way itself of godliness, they secretly endeavor to entangle us. The fourth, whenever you are overtaken by any fall, to look more into yourself and to consider more deeply your own utter feebleness. For to this end did God permit your fall, that warned by a clearer light of inspiration than before, and by a truer knowledge of yourself, you mightest learn to despise yourself as a thing most vile, and be willing to be so regarded by others. For without this willingness there can be no godly distrust of self, which is founded on genuine humility and on the experimental self-knowledge of which we have been speaking. This self-knowledge is indeed clearly necessary to all who seek after a union with the supreme light and uncreated truth, and divine mercy frequently makes use of the falls of proud and presumptuous men to lead them to this knowledge, justly suffering them to run into some fault which they trusted to their own strength to avoid, that so gaining a knowledge of themselves, they may learn to distrust self in every respect. But the Lord is not wont to employ so sad a method unto those more gracious means, of which we have before spoken, have been tried and have failed to work the good which his divine mercy had in view. He permits a man to fall more or less deeply in proportion to his pride and self-esteem, so that whenever there should be no presumption, there also would be no fall. Therefore, whensoever you do fall, 
at once betake yourself humbly to know yourself as you are. With earnest prayer, entreat the Lord to give you light truly to know yourself and entirely distrust yourself, lest you fall again, it may be, into a deeper sin. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of The Spiritual Combat This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roman Pallone The Spiritual Combat by Lorenzo Scapoli Chapter 3 Of Trust in God Distrust of self, necessary as it is, and as we have described it to be in this combat, is not alone sufficient. Unless we would be put to flight or remain overcome in the hands of our enemies, we must add to it perfect trust in God, hoping and expecting from Him alone all aid, victory, and good whatsoever. For inasmuch as we, who are nothing, can look to ourselves for nothing but faults, and therefore should entirely distrust ourselves. But with the help of our Lord, may we assuredly expect complete victory at all times. Therefore, in order to obtain his aid, let us arm our hearts with a lively confidence in him. And this also may be accomplished by four means. First, by beseeching God to grant it to us. Second, by gazing intently with the eye of faith at the infinite wisdom and omnipotence of God, with whom nothing is impossible or difficult, and by considering that His goodness is unbounded, and His willingness to give, hour by hour and moment by moment, all things needful for the spiritual life and for complete mastery over self, if we will throw ourselves with trustfulness into his arms. Our divine shepherd followed after his lost sheep for thirty-three years, with cries so piercing that his voice grew weak, and in a way so rough and thorny that he split his heart's blood and left his life there. When the poor sheep now follows him, through obedience to his commands, or through a desire, though at times but faint, to obey him, calling upon him and entreating him earnestly for help, is it possible that he should now refuse to turn upon it his life-giving glance? Will he not give ear to it and lay it upon his divine shoulders, rejoicing over it with all his friends and with the angels of heaven? For if our Lord ceased not to search most diligently and lovingly for the blind and dumb sinner, the lost coin of the gospel, till he found it, how is it possible that he should abandon him who, as a lost sheep, cries and calls piteously after his shepherd? And if God knocks continually at the heart of man, desiring to enter and sup there, and to communicate to him his gifts, who can believe that when the heart opens and invites him to enter, he will really turn a deaf ear and refuse to come in? The third way of acquiring this holy confidence is to call to mind that truth so plainly taught to us in many passages of Holy Scripture, that none who have trusted in God have ever been brought to confusion. The fourth, which will serve at once for the attainment of distrust in self and of trust in God, is this. When anything occurs to you to be done, any struggle with self to be undertaken, before you resolve upon it, first think upon your own weakness. Then, filled with distrust of self, turn to the wisdom, the power, and the goodness of God, and in reliance upon these, commence to labor and fight manfully. 
Then with these arms in your hands and with prayer, of which we shall speak later, go forth to action and to battle. Unless you observe this order, though you seem to yourself to be acting in reliance upon God, you will too often find yourself mistaken. For so common to man is a presumptuous reliance on self, and so subtle, that it lurks almost always even under our imagined distrust of self and the trust we fancy we have in God. That you may as much as possible escape presumption, and that all your works may be wrought in distrust of self and trust in God, you must first consider your own weakness, and next the omnipotence of God, and both these should precede all your undertakings. End of chapter 3 Chapter 4 of The Spiritual Combat by Lorenzo Scopoli This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Roman Pallone Chapter 4 How to Discover Whether We Distrust Ourselves and Place Our Confidence in God The presumptuous man is convinced that he has acquired a distrust of himself and confidence in God. But his mistake is never more apparent than when some fault is committed. For if he yields to anger and despairs of advancing in the way of virtue, it is evident that he placed his confidence in himself and not in God. The greater the anxiety and despondence, the greater is the certainty of his guilt. The man who has a deep distrust of himself and places great confidence in God is not at all surprised if he commits a fault. He does not abandon himself to confused despair. He correctly attributes what has happened to his own weakness and lack of confidence in God. Thus he learns to distrust himself more, and he places all his hopes in the assistance of the Almighty. He detests beyond all things the sin into which he has fallen. He condemns the passion or criminal habit that occasioned the fall. He conceives a deep sorrow for his offense against God. But his sorrow, accompanied by peace of mind, does not interrupt the method he has laid down, nor does it prevent the pursuit of his enemies to their final destruction. I sincerely wish that what has been proposed here would be attentively considered by many who think they are very devout. Yet from the moment they commit a fault, they will not be pacified, but hurry away to their director, more to rid themselves of the distress arising from self-love than from any other motive. Their principal care should be to wash away the guilt of sin in the sacrament of penance and to fortify themselves with the Eucharist against a relapse. End of chapter 4 Chapter 5 of The Spiritual Combat by Lorenzo Scopoli This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Roman Pallone Chapter 5 The Mistake of Considering Cowardice a Virtue Many are also deceived in this way. They ascribe to virtue the cowardice and anxiety that arises from sin. Although this weakness is accompanied by some sorrow, it is founded on a hidden pride and presumption of one's own strength. Thus the man who thinks he is far advanced in virtue looks with too much indifference on temptations and finds by sad experience that, like other men, he is subject to weakness. He is astonished at his fall, and finding himself deceived in his expectations, sinks into sorrow and despair. This never happens to the humble man who does not presume on his own strength, but places his trust in God alone. If he commits a fault, it occasions no surprise or anxiety, because he discovers by that light of truth, which is his guide, 
that his fall is due to his natural instability and weakness. End of chapter 5、Chapter、6 Recording Recording by Roman Pallone. Chapter 6 Further advice on how to obtain a distrust of oneself and confidence in God. As all our strength for conquering the enemy derives from distrust of self and confidence in God, I think I should give some additional advice very necessary for obtaining these virtues. In the first place, everyone must be convinced that neither all natural or acquired abilities. Nor all supernatural gifts or perfect knowledge of the scriptures, nor even whole ages spent in the service of his Creator, can enable him to do the will of God. He cannot perform his duty unless the hand of the Almighty sustains him as often as any good action is to be done, temptation to be overcome, dangers to be avoided, or crosses to be borne according to the will of God. This truth must be kept in mind every day, hour, and moment of his life. In this way, he will lose all presumption and will never rashly trust in himself. In order to acquire complete confidence in God, he must firmly believe that he is as perfectly capable of conquering a great number of enemies as a few, the strong and experienced as the weak and inexperienced. Consequently, although a soul is overwhelmed by sins, although it has labored in vain to tear away from vice and follow virtue, it should find its inclination to evil increasing daily instead of diminishing in favor of virtue. Yet it must not fail to place its confidence in God. It must not be discouraged or abandon its spiritual works. On the contrary, it must arouse itself to new fervor and redouble its efforts against the enemy. In this kind of battle, the victory will be won by him who has the courage not to throw down his arms or put aside his confidence in God. His assistance is always present for those that fight his battles, though he may sometimes permit them to be wounded. Persevere to the end. Victory depends on this. There is a swift and effective remedy for the wounds of anyone who fights for God's cause and who places his entire trust in Him. When he least expects it, he will see his enemy at his feet. End of chapter 6. Chapter 7 of the Spiritual Combat by Lorenzo Scapoli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Roman Pallone. Chapter 7 The Right Use of Our Faculties. The Understanding Must First Be Free of Ignorance and Curiosity. If we engage in the spiritual combat with no other weapons than a distrust of self and confidence in God, we will not only be deprived of a victory over our passions. But we must expect frequently to commit greater blunders. It is necessary, therefore, to employ correctly the faculties of body and soul. The third means we propose as requisite for the attainment of perfection. Let us begin with regulating the understanding and the will. The understanding must be freed from two great defects under which it frequently labors. The first is ignorance. This prevents the attainment of truth, the proper object of its inquiries. Exercise makes it lucid and brightens it, so that it can clearly discern how to purge the soul of all irregular attachments and adorn it with the necessary virtues. The means of accomplishing this are as follows The primary means is prayer, by which is sought the light of the Holy Spirit. Who never rejects those who earnestly seek God, who delight in obeying His law, and who in all decisions submit their own judgment 
to that of their superiors. The second is a persistent application to the serious and diligent examination of every object in order to distinguish the good from the evil. A judgment is formed which is not in accord with external appearances, the testimony of our senses, or the standards of a corrupt world. A judgment is formed which is not in accord with external appearances, the testimony of our senses, or the standards of a corrupt world, but which is conformable to the judgment of the Holy Spirit. Then we shall clearly see that what the world pursues with such eagerness and affection is mere vanity and illusion, that ambition and pleasure are dreams which, once shattered, are succeeded by sorrow and regret, that ignominy is a subject of glory and sufferings a source of joy, that nothing can be more noble or approach the divine nature more closely than to forgive those who injure us and to return good for evil. We shall see clearly that it is greater to despise the world than to have it at one's command, that it is infinitely preferable to submit to the humblest of men for God's sake than to command kings and princes, that a humble knowledge of ourselves surpasses the deepest sciences. In short, that greater praise is due to him who curbs his passions on the most trivial occasions than to him who conquers the strongest cities, defeats entire armies, or even works miracles and raises the dead to life. End of chapter 7 Chapter 8 of The Spiritual Combat by Lorenzo Scapoli This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Roman Pallone Chapter 8 An Obstacle to Forming a Correct Judgment An Aid to the Formation of a Correct Judgment Any difficulty in forming a correct judgment of the things we have just mentioned, and of many others also, arises from a superficial notion of love and hatred, from a hasty conception we might form of them at first glance. Since our reason is influenced by blind passions, everything appears in a far different light from that in which it should be considered. Whoever, therefore, desires to entrench himself against such a dangerous and common illusion must carefully preserve his heart free from all inordinate affection. When an object presents itself, let the understanding weigh its merits with mature deliberation before the will is permitted to embrace it if agreeable, or reject it if otherwise. As long as the understanding remains unbiased by the passions, it will easily distinguish between truth and falsehood, between real evil masquerading as good, and real good under the false appearance of evil. However, as soon as the will is moved either to love or hatred by the object, the understanding cannot form a true estimate of it, because the affection disguises it and imprints an incorrect idea. When this is again presented to the will, which already is prepossessed, it redoubles its love or hatred pushes beyond all limits, and is utterly deaf to the voice of reason. In this distorted confusion, the understanding plunges deeper and deeper into error, and represents the object to the will in vivid colors of good and evil. Consequently, whenever the rule laid down before, which is of the greatest importance on this occasion, is neglected, the two noblest faculties of the soul are bewildered in a network of error, darkness, and confusion. Happy are those who strip themselves of all attachment to creatures and then endeavor to discover the true nature of things before they permit their affections to be attached, who formulate their judgments by the principles of reason, and particularly by the supernatural guides which the Holy Spirit willingly communicates either immediately from himself or through those whom he has appointed as our directors. But remember, 
this advice very frequently must be followed more precisely in those things which are good in themselves than in those which are not completely good, because there is greater danger of deception. They usually engender a misconceived enthusiasm. Do nothing rashly, therefore, since a single unobserved factor of time or place may ruin everything. A great fault may be committed in the way a thing is done, as is true of many who have fashioned their own destruction in the practice of the holiest exercises. End of chapter 8、chapter、nine、of the Spiritual Combat by Lorenzo Scapoli This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Roman Pallone. Chapter 9 Another Method to Prevent Deception of the Understanding. Curiosity is another vice from which the mind must be free. If we indulge in vain, frivolous, or sinful dreams, our minds will become incapable of choosing the proper mortification of our disorderly affections. All earthly things, except those absolutely necessary, must die through our complete disregard for them, even though they are not wrong in themselves. We must control our minds and not permit them to wander aimlessly about. Our minds must become insensible to mundane projects, to gossip, to the feverish search for news. Our indifference to the affairs of this world must give them a dreamlike quality. The same holds true for heavenly things. We must be discreet and humble. Our greatest ambition must be to see the crucified Christ always before us, his life and death, what efforts he demands of us. Seek nothing beyond this. It will please the Divine Master. His real friends ask only for those things that will enable them to fulfill his commissions. Any other desire, any other quest, Is but self love, spiritual pride, and encirclement by the devil. Such a disciplined conduct is well fortified against the assaults of the devil. When this skilled opponent sees the fervor of persons beginning spiritual exercises and the fixed resolution of their wills, he insinuates his subtleties into their understanding. A breakthrough here permits him to push his way to the will. He is then the master of both these faculties. As a feint, he inflates their imagination in moments of prayer, suggesting elevated sentiments. He works particularly on those who are curious and discerning by nature, who are subject to self conceit and are fond of their own schemes. His aim, of course, is to amuse them with idle dreams and the sensible pleasure they afford. So that, drugged with a false sense of appreciation of God, they may forget to cleanse their hearts, to examine themselves, and to practice mortification. In this way, they become inflated with pride, and they idolize their own understanding. Having become accustomed to consult no one but themselves, they finally are persuaded that they no longer need the advice or assistance of others. It is a deadly and almost incurable disease. It is much more difficult to remedy pride of the understanding than that of the heart. As soon as pride of the heart is discovered by the intelligence, it can be removed by a voluntary submission to proper authorities. But if a person imagines and persists in maintaining that he is wiser than his superiors, how will his deception be shattered? How will he discover his error? To whose judgment will he submit so long as he considers himself wiser than the rest of the world? If the understanding, the searchlight of the soul, which alone can discover and rectify the vanity of the heart, is itself blinded and swollen with pride, who is able to cure it? If the light changes to darkness, if the leader is treacherous, What will happen to the rest? Be on guard, therefore, against such a fatal attack. Never let it overwhelm your minds. We must train ourselves to conform to the judgment of others, 
without carrying our notions of spirituality too high, let us become enamored with the folly and simplicity recommended so highly by the Apostle. Then shall we surpass Solomon himself in wisdom. End of chapter 9Chapter 10 of The Spiritual Combat by Lorenzo Scapoli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Roman Pallone. Chapter 10. The Exercise of the Will. The End to Which All Our Actions, Interior and Exterior, Should Be Directed. We have spoken concerning the necessity of regulating one's understanding. It is necessary also to control one's will so that it is not abandoned to its own inclinations, but it is conformed entirely to the will of God. It must be observed that it is not sufficient to desire or even to execute what is most pleasing to God. It is also requisite to desire and to perform our action under the influence of His grace and out of a willingness to please Him. Here will arise the greatest struggle with our nature, constantly thirsty for its own pleasure. Even in lofty spiritual undertakings, it seeks its own satisfaction, residing there without the least scruple, since there is no apparent evil. The following is the result. We begin acts of religion not from the sole motive of doing the will of God, but for a sensible pleasure that often accompanies such acts. The illusion is still more subtle as the object of our affection is more commendable in itself. Who would imagine that self-love, criminal as it is, should prompt us to unite ourselves to God? That, in our desire to possess Him, we should pursue our own interests rather than His glory and the accomplishment of His will which should be the only motive for those who love him, seek him, and profess to keep his laws. If we desire to avoid such a dangerous obstacle, we must accustom ourselves not to desire or execute anything unless it is through the impulse of the Holy Spirit, combined with a pure intention of honoring him, who desires to be not only the first principle, but also the last end of our every word and action through the observance of the following method. As soon as an opportunity presents itself to perform such a good action, we must prevent our heart from seizing on it before we have considered God. This will enable us to know whether it coincides with His will and whether we desire it solely because it is pleasing to Him. When our will is controlled and directed in this way by the will of God, it is motivated only with the desire to conform entirely to Him and to further His glory. The same method is to be followed in rejecting whatever is contrary to His will. The first move is to raise our minds to God, to know what is displeasing to Him, and then be satisfied that in its rejection we conform to His holy will. We must remember that it is extremely difficult to discover the deceptions of our fallen nature. It is always fond of making itself, for very questionable motives, the focal point of all things. It flatters by persuading us that in all our actions, our only motive is to please God. What we accept or reject, then, is actually done to please ourselves while we erroneously imagine that we act out of a desire to please or a dread of displeasing our Sovereign Lord. The most effective remedy against evil is purity of heart. Everyone engaged in the spiritual combat must be armed with it, discarding the old man and putting on the new. The remedy is applied in this way. In everything that we undertake, pursue, or reject, we divest ourselves of all human considerations and do only what is conformable to the will of God. 
It may happen that in many things we do, and especially in the interior impulses of the heart, or in swiftly transient exterior actions, we may not always be conscious of the influence of this motive, but at least we should be so disposed that virtually and habitually we act from the viewpoint of pleasing God. In more prolonged activities, this virtual intention is not sufficient. It should be frequently renewed and developed to its full stature in purity and fervor. Without this, we run the great risk of deception by self-love, which always prefers the creature to the Creator, and so deceives that in a short time we are imperceptibly drawn from our primary intention. Well-meaning but vulnerable persons generally set out with no other purpose than to please God. But by degrees they permit themselves, without knowing it, to be lured away by vanity. They forget the divine will which first influenced them and are completely absorbed in the satisfaction afforded by their actions and in the advantages and rewards they expect. If it happens that while they think they are accomplishing great things, providence permits them to be interrupted by sickness or some accident, they are immediately dissatisfied, criticizing everyone about them, and sometimes even God himself. This is clear evidence that the motive, the force behind their actions, was bad. Anyone who acts under the influence of divine grace and only to please God is indifferent as to his course of action. Or, if he is inclined to some particular activity, he completely submits to providence, the manner and time of doing it. He is perfectly resigned to whatever success attends his undertakings, and his heart desires nothing but the accomplishment of the divine will. Therefore let everyone examine himself. Let him direct all his actions to this most excellent and noble end. If he discovers that he is performing a work of piety in order to avoid punishment or to gain the rewards of the future life, he should establish as the end of his undertaking the will of God, who requires that we avoid hell and gain heaven. It is not within man's power to realize the efficacy of this motive. The least action, no matter how insignificant, performed for his sake, greatly surpasses actions which, although of greater significance, are done for other motives. For example, a small alms given solely in honor of God is infinitely more agreeable to him than if, from some other motive, large possessions are abandoned, even if this is done from a desire to gain the kingdom of heaven. And this in itself is a highly commendable motive and worthy of our consideration. The practice of performing all of our actions solely from the intention of pleasing God may be difficult at first. With the passing of time, it will become familiar and even delightful if we strive to find God in all sincerity of heart, if we continually long for Him, the only and greatest good, deserving to be sought, valued, and loved by all His creatures. The more attentively we contemplate the greatness and goodness of God, the more frequently and tenderly our affections will turn to that divine object. In this way, we will more quickly and with greater facility obtain the habit of directing all our actions to His glory. In conclusion, there is a final way of acting in complete accordance with this very excellent and elevated motive. This is fervently to petition our Lord for grace, and frequently to consider the infinite benefits He has already given us, and which He continues to bestow every moment from an undeserved and disinterested affection. End of chapter 10 
Chapter 11 of The Spiritual Combat by Lorenzo Scapoli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Roman Pallone. Chapter 11 Some Considerations Which Will Incline the Will to Seek Only What Is Pleasing to God. In order to incline our will to fulfill exactly the will of God and to promote His glory, let us remember that He has set the example by loving and honoring us in a thousand different ways. He created us out of nothing, after His own likeness, and He subordinated all other things to our use. In our redemption, He passed by the most brilliant angel to choose His only Son, who paid the price of the world not with perishable gold or silver, but with his sacred blood in a death as cruel as it was wretched. He continually guards us from the fury of our enemies. He fights for us with his grace, and to nourish and strengthen us, he is always ready to feed us with the precious body of his Son in the sacrament of the altar. Do not these constitute convincing proofs of God's tremendous love for us? Who can understand the immensity of his love for such wretched creatures? What should be our gratitude towards so generous a benefactor? If the great men of the world think they are obliged to do something in return for the respect paid them, even by those inferior as to position and wealth, What return ought not the very worms of the earth make when honored with such a remarkable love and esteem by the sovereign Lord of the universe? In particular, we must never forget that His Majesty is infinitely worthy of our service, a service motivated by a single principle of love, whose only object is His will and desire. End of chapter 11. Chapter 12 of The Spiritual Combat by Lorenzo Scopoli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Roman Pallone. Chapter 12 The Opposition Within Man's Twofold Nature. Man has a twofold nature the one superior, the other inferior. The first is generally termed reason. The second is called appetite, sensuality, or passion. Reason is the distinguishing property of man, and he is not considered responsible for the primary impulses of his appetite unless his superior faculty confirms the choice. The entire spiritual warfare, consequently, consists in this. The rational faculty is placed between the divine will above it and the sensitive appetite below it, and is attacked from both sides, God moving it by his grace and the flesh by its appetites. It is apparent, then, that inconceivable difficulties arise when persons who during their youth have contracted vicious habits resolve to change their life, mortify their passions, and break with the world in order to devote themselves to the service of God. The will is violently attacked by divine grace and by its own sensual appetites, and wherever it turns, it absorbs these withering attacks with the greatest difficulty. This onslaught is not experienced by those who are firmly settled in their way of life, whether in virtue, by conforming to the will of God, or in vice, by indulging their sensual desires. No one should delude himself that he can acquire virtue and serve God in the proper way unless he is willing to undergo a violent struggle He must conquer the difficulty he will experience when he deprives himself 
of the pleasures, great or small, to which he has been viciously attached. The result is that very few attain any great degree of perfection. After conquering their greatest vice, after undergoing tremendous exertions, they lose courage and fail to pursue their objective. And this, when only small trials are to be overcome, such as subduing the feeble remnants of their own will and annihilating some weaker passions, which revive and then completely regain their hearts. Many persons of this type, for example, do not take what belongs to others, but they are passionately attached to what is their own. They do not use any illegal methods of aggrandizement, but instead of spurning advancement, they are fond of it and seek it by any means they think lawful. They observe the appointed fasts, but on other days they indulge in the most exotic delicacies. They are very careful to observe chastity, and yet they refuse to give up their favorite amusements, even though they constitute great obstacles to a spiritual life and real union with God. Since these things are so highly dangerous, particularly for those who do not recognize their bad results, they must be dealt with very cautiously. Without such caution, we may be assured that most of our good acts will have as attendants slothfulness, vanity, human respect, hidden imperfections, conceit, and a desire for the notice and approval of others. Anyone who neglects this particular aspect of the problem not only makes no progress on the road to salvation, but even loses ground and is in danger of falling back into his former vicious practices. He does not aim at solid virtue and is unconscious of the great favor God has done him by freeing him from the despotism of the devil. He is ignorant of the danger that surrounds him and is enchanted by a false and deceptive peace. It is necessary here to point out an illusion which must be feared, as it is not easily discovered. Many who begin a spiritual life have too great a love for themselves, if they can be said to truly love themselves, and they single out certain exercises that are most pleasant, but they avoid anything that is disagreeable to their inclinations or equipped to mortify their passions, against which their entire force should be thrown in this spiritual struggle. Every means must be exploited to make them enjoy the hazards they encountered in conquering their inclinations. On this, everything depends. The greater the resolution shown in surmounting the first obstacles that occur, the swifter and more brilliantly will victory accompany them. With courage, therefore, let them expect nothing but hardship in this warfare, and wait patiently for victory and its rewards. Then they may be confident that they will not be disappointed. End of chapter 12「Chapter 13 of the Spiritual Combat by Lorenzo Scapoli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Roman Pallone. Chapter 13. How we are to encounter sensuality. What the will must do to acquire virtuous habits. When our Creator and sensuality struggle for possession of our hearts, victory will follow the side of heaven if we use the following tactics. 1. The first impulses of the sensual appetite that oppose reason must be carefully checked, that the will should not give its consent to them. 2. After this is done, they may be released in order to give them a greater setback. 3. A third trial may be given in order to steel ourselves, 
to repulse them with generous contempt. It is necessary to observe that these methods of arousing the passions are not to be used where chastity is involved. We shall speak of this later. 4. Lastly, it is extremely important to perform acts of those virtues which are opposed to the vicious inclinations we encounter. The following example will place this in a clear light. You are, it may be supposed, subject to impatience. Recollect yourself. Examine what is passing through your mind. You will observe that the trouble which first arose in the lower appetite attempts to control the will and the higher faculties. Here, as I mentioned previously, you must stop it and prevent it from prevailing on the will. Do not leave the field until your enemy is entirely subdued and reduced in proper subjection to the reason. But you see the cleverness of the tempter. If he finds out that you courageously overcome impetuous passion, he not only ceases to light it in your heart, but even assists in banking the fire for the present. His plan is to prevent the attainment of the contrary virtue by a steady resistance, and to inflate you with the vanity of thinking you are a great soldier for having defeated your enemy in such a short time. You must renew this procedure. Bring to mind what first moved you to impatience. When you recognize the same emotion rising in your lower appetite, mobilize the entire force of your will to suppress it. It frequently happens that after the most strenuous engagements with the enemy, which have been motivated by the desire of fulfilling our duty and pleasing God, we are not entirely out of danger or defeat by a third attack we must once more fight the passion we combated and arouse not only hatred, but also contempt and horror of it. Briefly, if you want to equip your soul with virtue and acquire habitual sanctity, it is necessary to practice frequent acts of the virtue which is contrary to your vicious inclinations. For example, if you want to acquire a high degree of patience, you must not consider it sufficient to employ the three types of weapon that have been mentioned in order to overcome all the impatience occasioned by the contempt you endure from others. You must proceed even to an affection for the contempt itself, to wish for its repetition, even from the same persons, to resolve to endure patiently even greater insults. The reason we must form acts which are directly contrary to our failings if we desire to attain perfection, is this. Other acts of virtue, however efficacious and frequent, do not strike directly at the root of the evil. To continue the example, although you do not give consent to impulses of anger, but deal with them in the ways described, yet be certain of this, unless you accustom yourself to enjoy contempt and be happy in it, you will never entirely root out the vice of impatience, for it springs up from a dread of contempt and a fondness for the applause of men. As long as the root of this weed is not torn out, it will sprout again, and your virtue will perish. In time, you may discover that you are stripped of good habits and in continual danger of falling back into your former disorders. Never hope to acquire solid virtue, unless you destroy your own particular failings by performing frequent acts which are directly opposed to them. I say frequent acts, for frequent acts are necessary to build a virtuous habit, just as many sins are required to confirm oneself in a vicious habit. In fact, a greater number of acts must be performed in the former instance, because our weakened nature resists the one side as much as it assists the other. You will observe that certain virtues cannot be acquired without performing external acts corresponding to the interior dispositions. This is true with regard to patience. You must not only speak with great charity and mildness to those who have injured you, no matter how great the offense, but even help them to the limit of your abilities. 
Although these acts, whether external or internal, may seem insignificant and even greatly repugnant, do not omit them. However small they may seem, they will certainly support you in the struggle and will greatly contribute to your victory. Guard your mind, therefore, and do not be content to restrain the most violent surges of passion. Resist the most minute. They generally lead to the greater and pave the way to deeply vicious habits. Does not experience teach us that many who neglect to mortify their passions in trivialities, although they show courage in heroic trials, are unexpectedly trapped and viciously attacked by enemies that have never been entirely destroyed? There is another thing most sincerely recommended. Mortify your inclinations, even when the object in itself is lawful but not necessary. It will facilitate victory on other occasions. You will gain experience and strength against temptation and present yourself as acceptable to your Savior. This is sincere advice. Do not fail to exert yourself in the practices mentioned. They are absolutely requisite for the perfect formation of your soul. You will quickly gain a great victory over yourself. You will advance rapidly on the path of virtue. Your life will become spiritual, not only in appearance, but in reality. If you follow other methods, however excellent you consider them, though you taste the greatest spiritual delights, though you imagine yourself intimately united to God, you can depend on this. You will never acquire solid virtue, nor know what true spirituality is. This does not, as has been shown in the first chapter, consist in acts that are agreeable or pleasant to our nature, but in those that crucify it and all its irregular attractions. In this way, man, renewed by his acquired virtues, unites himself completely to his Creator and crucified Savior. It is certain that vicious habits are contracted by several acts of the will which yield to sensual appetites. In the same way, evangelical perfection is attained by repeated acts of the will, conforming itself to the will of God, who moves it to practice different virtues at different times. The will incurs no guilt unless it gives consent to an act, even if the entire force of the lower appetite is exerted towards a guilty end. On the other hand, the will cannot be sanctified and united to God, however strong the grace attracting it, unless it cooperates with that grace by interior acts and, if requisite, by exterior acts. End of chapter 13 the Spiritual Combat Chapter 14 of The Spiritual Combat by Lorenzo Scapoli This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Roman Pallone Chapter 14 What to do when the will is apparently overpowered and unable to resist the sensual appetites. If you ever fear that your will should fall before the lower appetite or other enemies that attempt to overcome it, if you perceive that your courage and determination are failing, hold your ground. Do not retreat from the field. You must regard the victory as your own as long as you are not completely overcome. Just as your will does not need the consent of the lower appetite to make its choice, in the same way the liberty of the will remains intact, despite any violence that this interior enemy may use. An absolute dominion has been given us by the Almighty. All the senses, the evil spirits, and the whole created universe, banded together, cannot diminish the liberty of the will in acting as often in any manner and to any end that it desires. But if at times temptations press you so hard that your will, almost overpowered, seems to lack sufficient strength to resist any longer. Do not be disheartened or throw down your arms. Defend yourself and cry out. 
I shall never surrender to you. I shall not submit to you. Act like a person who's struggling with a stubborn enemy and being unable to pierce him with the point, attacks him with the hilt of the sword. Watch how he tries to break free, to retreat in order to charge with greater strength, and to kill the enemy with one fatal blow. This teaches you to withdraw frequently into yourself. Recall your insignificance, your inability to accomplish anything. You will then place great confidence in the almighty power of God, so that you will be able, through his grace, to attack and conquer the passions that oppose you. Here you must implore, My Lord, my Lord, Jesus, Mary, do not abandon your soldier. Do not permit me to be conquered by this temptation. Whenever the enemy gives you a breathing spell, call up your understanding to reinforce your will. Strengthen it with motives that will raise its courage and give it new life for the fight. For example, if you are unjustly accused or harmed in some other way, and in desperation are tempted to lose all patience, try to check yourself by reflecting on these points. 1. Consider whether you might not deserve the unpleasantness you are undergoing, and whether you have not brought it upon yourself. If you are in any way to blame, it is proper that you patiently endure the agony of the wound, which you yourself have occasioned. 2. However, if you are not guilty on this score, glance back at some past offenses for which divine justice has not yet inflicted a punishment, and for which you have not sufficiently expiated by a voluntary penance. When you see that God in his infinite mercy, instead of a long punishment in purgatory, or even an eternal one in hell, has decreed but an easy and momentary one in this life, accept it not merely with resignation, but with joyous thanksgiving. 3. If you think without reason that your faults are few, that you do a great amount of penance, remember that the road to heaven is narrow and full of obstacles. 4. Even if you could find another road, a burning love should prevent you from considering it, for the Son of God and all the saints after him, took no other road than the thorny path of the cross. 5. What you should keep in mind at this and all other times is the will of God. He loves you so tenderly that he is delighted with every heroic act of virtue you perform, and with the return of your fidelity and courage to his immense love. Remember also that the more unjustly you suffer, and consequently the more grievous your affliction, the greater is your merit in the sight of God. For in the midst of your suffering you adore his judgments and willingly submit to his divine providence, which draws good from the greatest evil and makes the malice of our enemies subservient to our eternal happiness. End of chapter 14「Chapter 15 of the Spiritual Combat by Lorenzo Scapoli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Roman Pallone. Chapter 15. Further advice on how to fight skillfully, the enemies we are to engage, and the courage necessary to fight them. You have seen the conduct that must be observed to gain the victory over self, and to attain the necessary virtues. To do this with greater facility and speed, we must not be content with exhibiting our courage but a single time. It is necessary to return so often to the battle, particularly when engaged with self-love, that at last we can judge all those our friends from whom we receive the most cruel and mortifying injuries. It frequently happens that where this kind of combat is shirked, the victories are harder, very imperfect, less frequent, and soon lost again. Fight, therefore, with great determination. Do not let the weakness of your nature be an excuse. If your strength fails you, ask more from God. 
he will not refuse your request. Consider this. If the fury of your enemies is great and their numbers overwhelming, the love which God holds for you is infinitely greater. The angel who protects you and the saints who intercede for you are more numerous. There are many women who, through these considerations, have baffled the wisdom of the world, conquered the allurements of the flesh, triumphed over the malice of the devil. Do not, therefore, lose heart, although you may think that it is a difficult task to absorb the attacks of so many enemies, that this warfare will continue your entire lifetime, and that inescapable ruin threatens you on all sides. But remember this, neither the power nor the trickery of your enemies can hurt you without the permission of him whose honor you fight. He delights in this kind of battle, and as far as possible encourages everyone to engage in it. But he is so far from permitting your enemies to accomplish their evil plans that he will fight on your side and sooner or later crown your endeavors with victory though the battle may end only with your life. All he asks of you is that you defend yourself courageously, and that despite any wounds you may receive, you never lay down your arms or leave the battleground. You must not shirk your duty. This war is unavoidable, and you must either fight or die. The obstinacy of your enemies is so fierce that peace and arbitration with them is utterly impossible. End of chapter 15The soldier of Christ must prepare early for the battle. The first thing to do when you awake is to open the windows of your soul. Consider yourself as on the field of battle, facing the enemy, and bound by the iron-clad law, either fight or die. Imagine the enemy before you that particular vice or disorderly passion that you are trying to conquer. Imagine this hideous opponent is about to overwhelm you. At the same time, picture at your right Jesus Christ, your invincible leader, accompanied by the Blessed Virgin, St. Joseph, whole companies of angels and saints, and particularly the glorious Archangel Michael. At your left is Lucifer and his troops, ready to support the passion or vice you are fighting, and resolved to do anything to cause your defeat. Imagine your guardian angel thus spurring you on. Today you must fight to conquer your enemy and anyone who tries to ruin you. Be courageous. Do not be afraid or cowardly. Christ, your captain, is here with all the power of heaven to protect you from the enemy and to see that they never conquer you, either by brute power or by trickery. Hold your ground. Do violence to yourself, no matter how painful it is. Call out for the help of Jesus and Mary and all the saints. If you do this, you will be victorious. It does not matter how weak you are, how strong the enemy may seem, either in number or in power. Do not be discouraged. The help you have from heaven is more powerful than all that hell can send to destroy the grace of God in your soul. God, the Creator and the Redeemer, is almighty and more desirous of your salvation than the devil can be of your destruction. Fight courageously, then, and do not neglect to mortify yourself. Continual war on your inordinate inclinations and vicious habits will gain the victory, acquire the kingdom of heaven, and unite your soul to God forever.
begin to fight immediately in the name of the Lord, armed with distrust of yourself, with confidence in God, in prayer, and with the correct use of the faculties of your soul. With these weapons, attack the enemy, that predominant passion you want to conquer, either by courageous resistance, repeated acts of the contrary virtue, or any means that heaven gives you to drive it out of your heart. Do not rest until it is conquered. Your endurance will be rewarded by the Supreme Judge, who, with the entire church triumphant, has witnessed your behavior. To repeat, you must not become tired of this war. Everyone must serve and please God. It is impossible to avoid this fight. If anyone flees, he is exposed to being wounded and even destroyed. By revolting against God and indulging in a life of sensuality with the world, the difficulties are not lessened because both body and soul suffer greatly when given to luxury and ambition. There is a great lack of vision in one who pursues this troublesome path, which leads to endless agony in the next life, in order to avoid small difficulties, which will soon end in an eternity of happiness and the never-ending enjoyment of God. End of chapter 16「Chapter Seventeen of the Spiritual Combat by Lorenzo Scapoli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Roman Pallone. Chapter Seventeen: The Method of Fighting Your Passions and Vices. It is very important to know the procedure that must be followed in fighting your passions and vices, so that you will not run about blindly and merely beat the air as so many do. They lose all the fruits of their labor. You must begin with recollection in order to know what thoughts and desires usually occupy your mind. You must know your dominant passion, which must be singled out as your greatest enemy, the first to be attacked. But if your enemy, as a diverting movement, should attack at another point, you must move to the point that is the most threatened, and then immediately return to your primary position. End of chapter 17 Chapter 18 of The Spiritual Combat by Lorenzo Scapoli This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Roman Pallone Chapter 18 How to Curb the Sudden Impulses of Your Passions If you are not able as yet to bear patiently the injuries, insults, and other disturbances of this life, you must harden yourself for this task by foresight and by preparing for their reception. Having discovered the nature of the passion from which you suffer the most, you must consider what kind of persons you have to deal with, what places you are wont to visit. From this data, you can discover just what disturbances are likely to occur. However, if any unforeseen accident should happen, although it is a tremendous advantage never to be unprepared for any mortification or trouble, we shall point out a way of greatly relieving it. The moment you find that you are affected by some unforeseen injurious circumstance, be on your guard. Do not lose your self-control. Raise your mind to God and regard the occurrence as a trial from heaven. Reflect that God himself, gentle Father that he is, permits this only that you may be able to purify yourself still more and unite yourself more closely to him. He is infinitely pleased when he sees you cheerfully undergo the greatest trials for his sake. Then turn your thoughts to yourself. Reprimand your lack of courage in this way. Coward! 
Why do you turn from a cross placed upon you, not by an ordinary person, but by your Father who is in heaven? Then, turning to this cross, accept it, not only with submission, but with joy, saying, O cross, made for me from the beginning by divine providence, cross that the love of my crucified Jesus makes sweeter to me than the greatest of sensual pleasures. Place me upon thee, that I may be united to him who became my Redeemer when he died in your arms. But if you find that you have been influenced so greatly that you are incapable of elevating your mind to God, that even your will is affected, stop the evil there. It does not matter what agitation may have been stirred up in your heart. Spare nothing to conquer it. Beg heaven for assistance with great fervor. Of course, the surest way of checking these first impulses of improper desires is to endeavor to eliminate the cause beforehand. For example, if you see that because of an excessive attachment to anything, you are angered whenever your inclinations are denied, Break off that attachment, and you will enjoy perfect peace. If the uneasiness you feel does not come from a liking for some pleasure, but from a dislike of some person who seems disagreeable to you in every act he performs, the best cure for this disease is to endeavor to love this person, despite the antipathy you may feel. Do this not only because he was created to the same image of God and redeemed by the same precious blood of Christ as yourself, but also because by bearing patiently with certain defects, you imitate your heavenly Father, whose love and goodness extends to all people without exception. End of chapter 18. Chapter 19 of The Spiritual Combat. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Spiritual Combat by Lorenzo Scupoli. Chapter 19 of The Way to Resist the Sins of the Flesh. This vice must be resisted in a way peculiar to itself and different from all others. In order, therefore, to a successful resistance, three periods must be observed. 1. Before we are tempted. 2. When we are tempted. 3. After the temptation is over. 1. Before the temptation, the struggle will be against those things which are wont to occasion this temptation. First, thou must battle against the vice, but not attempt to face it, avoiding to the utmost of thy power every occasion and every person whereby thou mayest fall into the slightest danger. And if compelled at times to converse with such, let it be done briefly, with a grave and modest demeanor, and using words of severity rather than of excessive tenderness and affability. Neither be confident in thyself, because thou art still, and hast been, after many years' practice, free from temptations of the flesh, For this accursed vice will do in an hour what in many years it has failed to effect, often making its preparations secretly, and it hurts the more grievously, and wounds the more incurably, the more friendly the form under which it appears, and the less occasion of suspicion it seems to give. And oftentimes there is much to be feared, as experience has shown and still shows, when intercourse is carried on under fair and lawful pretexts such as kindred, relative duty, or again, great virtue in the person beloved. For with this too frequent and imprudent intercourse, the poisonous pleasure of sense mingles itself, instilling its venom by degrees, till it penetrates into the marrow of the soul, and clouds the reason more and more, until no account is made of things which are really dangerous, such as loving glances, tender words on either side, and the delights of conversation, and so, a change creeping over both, they fall at last into destruction, or into some temptation, most hard and toilsome to overcome. Once more I say to thee, fly, for thou art a stubble. 
trust not to being bathed in and filled with the water of a good and strong purpose and resolved and ready rather to die than to offend god for by frequent stirring the heat of the fire will gradually dry up the water of thy good purpose and when thou least thinkest it will so inflame thee that thou wilt respect neither kindred nor friends wilt neither fear god nor regard life nor honour nor all the pains of hell therefore fly fly if indeed thou wouldst not be overtaken led captive and slain secondly avoid idleness and be vigilant and awake with the thoughts and deeds suitable to thy state of life thirdly never resist the will of thy superiors but show them a ready obedience executing promptly all their commands and with most willingness such as humble thee and are most opposed to thy natural will and inclination fourthly beware of forming rash judgments of thy neighbour especially with regard to this vice and if he have plainly fallen have pity on him be not bitter against him nor hold him in contempt but rather gather from his fall the fruit of humility and self-knowledge confessing thyself to be but dust and ashes drawing nigher unto god in prayer and shunning more carefully than ever all intercourse wherein there may be even the shadow of danger for if thou art ready to judge and despise others god will correct thee to thy cost and suffer thee to fall into the same fault in order to convince thee of thy pride that by such humiliation both sins may be cured and if thou shouldest not fall into this sin yet unless thou lay aside thy uncharitable judgment of others thy state will be one of great doubtfulness fifthly and lastly beware lest finding thyself gifted with some enjoyment of spiritual delights thou feel a certain vain complacency therein and persuade thyself that thou art something and that thine enemies are now no longer able to attack thee because thou seemest to thyself to regard them with disgust horror and hatred for if thou art incautious in this matter thou wilt easily fall two in the hour of temptation consider whether it proceeds from inward or outward causes by outward i mean curiosity of the eyes or ears over niceness in dress habits and conversations which incite to this sin the remedies in such cases are purity modesty refusing to see or hear things which incite to this vice and as i said before flight the inward causes are either the rebellion of the body or thoughts of the mind proceeding either from our evil habits or else from suggestions of the devil the rebellion of the body must be mortified by fasts disciplines hair shirts vigils and other like hard dealing with the body as prudence and obedience may teach against evil thoughts from whatever source arising the remedies are as follows one employment in the various duties proper to our state in life two prayer and meditation prayer should be made in the following manner when thou art first conscious of the presence of these evil thoughts or even of such as may signify their approach fly instantly in spirit to the crucified saviour saying my jesus my sweet jesus help me speedily that i fall not into the hands of this enemy and sometimes embracing the cross on which thy lord is extended and kissing repeatedly the wounds of his sacred feet say lovingly o oh, beauteous wounds chaste wounds holy wounds wound now this miserable impure heart of mine and free it from all that offendeth thee at the moment when temptations to carnal delights assail thee i would not have thee meditate upon certain points which are recommended in many books as remedies against this temptation such as the vileness of this vice its insatiableness the loathing the bitterness which follow it the peril and ruin of estate life honour and such like for this is not always a sure way to overcome the temptation but may prove rather hurtful than otherwise for if on the one hand the mind drives away these thoughts on the other it gives us an opportunity and exposes us to the danger of taking delight in them and of consenting thereto therefore the true remedy in all these cases is flight not from these thoughts alone but from everything however opposite which may bring them before us let then thy meditation for this end be on the life and passion of thy crucified lord 
and if during thy meditation the same thoughts again present themselves against thy will and molest thee more than usual which will very probably happen be not therefore discouraged nor leave off thy meditation but pursue it with all possible intensity not turning from it even to repel such thoughts but giving thyself no more concern about them than if they in no way belong to thee there is no better method than this of resisting them how incessant soever be their attacks thou wilt then conclude thy meditation with this or some similar supplication deliver me o my creator and redeemer from my enemies to the honour of thy passion and of thine unspeakable goodness suffer not thy thoughts to return again to the sin for the bare recollection of it is not without danger neither stay at any time to reason with such temptations whether thou hast consented unto them or not for this is a device of the devil who seeks under the appearance of good to disquiet thee and make thee distrustful and faint-hearted or hopes by entangling thee in such discourses to draw thee into some sin therefore in this temptation when the consent is not evident it is sufficient that thou confess the whole briefly to thy spiritual father and then rest satisfied with his opinion without thinking of it more but be sure to reveal faithfully every thought to him neither be restrained from doing so by shame nor by any other consideration for if in dealing with all our enemies we have need of the grace of humility to enable us to subdue them in this case more than in any other are we bound to humble ourselves this vice being almost always the punishment of pride three when the time of temptation is past what thou hast to do is this however free however perfectly secure thou mayest feel from danger keep far away from those objects which gave rise to the temptation even shouldst thou be induced to do otherwise for some good and useful end for this is a deceit of our evil nature and a snare of our cunning adversary who transforms himself into an angel of light that he may bring us into darkness End of chapter 19 chapter 20 of the spiritual combat this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the spiritual combat by lorenzo scupoli chapter 20 of the way to combat sloth to avoid falling into the miserable bondage of sloth which would not only hinder thy progress towards perfection but also deliver thee into the hands of thine enemies thou must avoid all curiosity concerning earthly things and all attachment to them and also every kind of employment which belongs not to thy condition next thou must earnestly endeavour to answer readily to every holy inspiration from above and to every command of thy superiors doing everything at the time and in the manner which is pleasing to them never delay even for a moment for that one little delay will soon be followed by another and then by a third and then by others and to these latter the senses will yield and give way more easily than to the former being already allured and taken captive by the pleasure they have therein enjoyed hence the duty to be performed is either begun too late or sometimes altogether neglected as being too irksome thus little by little a habit of sloth is acquired which in time reduces us to such a state that ashamed of our present excessive sloth which we cannot disguise from ourselves we purpose even while held in bondage by it to be in future very diligent and active the poison of sloth overspreads the whole man not only infecting the will by making it hate exertion but blinding also the understanding so that it is unable to see how vain and unfounded are its intentions of doing promptly and diligently at some future season that which should be done at once but which is either voluntarily neglected altogether or deferred to another time nor is it enough that we perform our appointed work quickly we must in order to bring it to its highest possible perfection do it at the very time required by the nature and quality of the work and with all befitting diligence 
for that is not diligence, but the subtlest form of sloth, which leads us to do our work before its time, not seeking to do it well, but dispatching it hastily, that we may then give ourselves up to the sluggish repose, on which our thoughts have been dwelling, whilst we have been hurrying over our business. All this great evil proceeds from want of duly considering the value of a good work when performed at its right time and with a spirit determined to brave the toil and difficulties which the sin of sloth puts in the way of untried soldiers thou shouldest therefore often remember that a single lifting up of the heart to god a single bending of the knee in his honour is of more value than all the treasures of the world and that each time we do violence to ourselves and to our sinful passions angels bring to our soul from the kingdom of heaven a crown of glorious victory recollect also on the other hand that god gradually withdraws from the slothful the graces which he had once bestowed upon them while he increases that of the diligent permitting them to enter at last into his joy if thou art not at first equal to a bold encounter with toil and hardship conceal them from thyself that they appear not to thee so formidable as sloth would represent them the exercise to which thou art called is perhaps to acquire some virtue by many repeated acts by many days of toil the enemy to be overcome seem to thee many and strong begin then these acts as if thou hast but a few of them to perform but a few days conflict to endure fight only against one adversary as if there were no more to be resisted and in full confidence that with the help of god thou wilt be stronger than they in this manner sloth will begin to grow weak and will give way at last to the gradual entrance of the opposite virtue i would say the same of prayer one hour of prayer is perhaps necessary for thee and this seems a hard matter to sloth but represent to her that thou wouldest pray but for the eighth part of an hour thou wilt then easily pass to another eighth and so on to the whole but if in the second or any other of these divisions thou shouldest feel too violent a repugnance and difficulty leave the exercise a while lest thou become weary but return to it in a little time thou shouldest pursue the same method with respect to manual labours when thou art called upon to undertake things which to sloth seem many in number and hard to be done and so cause thee much disturbance begin nevertheless courageously and quietly with one as if thou hadst no more to do and when thou hast diligently accomplished this thou wilt be able to perform all the others with far less toil than to thy sloth would have seemed possible for if thou dost not pursue this method and encounter resolutely the toil and hardship which lie in thy way the vice of sloth will gain such a mastery over thee that thou wilt be for ever harassed and annoyed not only by the present toil and difficulty which will always attend the first exercises of virtue but even by the distant prospect of them thou wilt be for ever in fear of being tried and assailed by enemies or laden with some fresh burden so that even in the time of peace thou wilt live in a perpetual unrest know also my daughter that this vice of sloth will not only with its secret poison gradually rot the first and feeble roots which would in time have produced habits of virtue but even the roots of habits already acquired like a worm in wood it will go on insensibly gnawing and eating away the marrow of the spiritual life by this means does the devil seek to ensnare and delude all men but especially spiritual persons watch therefore pray and labor diligently and defer not to weave the web of thy wedding garment that thou be found ready adorned to meet the bridegroom and remember day by day that he who gives thee the morning does not promise thee the evening and though he gives the evening yet promises not the morrow spend therefore every moment of every hour according to god's will as if it were thy last and so much the more as for each moment thou wilt have to give the strictest account i conclude by warning thee to count that day lost though thou mayest have dispatched much business therein in which thou hast neither gained some victory over thine evil inclinations and thy self-will nor return thanks to thy lord for his mercies and especially for his bitter passion endured for thee and for his sweet and fatherly correction 
in having made thee worthy to receive at his hand the priceless treasure of suffering. End of chapter 20. Chapter 21 of The Spiritual Combat. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Spiritual Combat by Lorenzo Scupoli. Chapter 21 of the regulation of the outward senses and the way to pass on from these to the contemplation of the divinity. Great watchfulness and continual exercise is needful for the due ordering and regulating of the outward senses, for the appetite, which is, as it were, the captain of our corrupt nature, inclines to an immoderate seeking after pleasure and enjoyment, and being unable by itself alone to attain unto them, it makes use of the senses as its soldiers and as natural instruments for beholding objects, whose images it draws to itself and impresses on the mind. Hence arises the sensation of pleasure, which by means of the relation subsisting between the mind and the flesh, spreads through all the senses which are capable of such pleasure, infecting both soul and body with a common contagion which corrupts the whole. Thou seest the evil, mark the remedy. Take good heed not to let thy senses stray freely where they will, nor to use them where pleasure alone, and not usefulness, necessity, or any good end leads thee to do so. And if, unawares, they have wandered too far, recall them instantly, or so regulate them, that instead of remaining as before, in a miserable captivity to empty pleasures, they may gather a noble spoil from each passing object, and bring it home to the soul, that she, collected within herself, may, with a steadier flight, rise towards heaven in the contemplation of God, which may be done as follows. When any object presents itself to one of thine outward senses, separate in your mind from the created thing, the spirit which is in it, and reflect that of itself, it possesses nothing of all that which appears to thy senses, but that all is the work of God who by his spirit endows it unseen with the being, beauty, goodness, or what virtue soever belongs to it. Then rejoice that thy Lord alone is the cause and principle of so great and such varied perfections, and that in himself they are all contained in the highest degree, all created excellencies being but the minutest degrees of his divine and infinite perfections. When occupied in the contemplation of objects of a noble nature, thou wilt in thy mind bring down the creature to its own nothingness, fixing thy mind's eye on the great creator therein present, who endured it with that nature, and delighting thyself in him alone, thou wilt say, O divine essence, to be desired above all things, how do I rejoice that thou alone art the infinite principle of every created being? In like manner, at the sight of trees, herbs, or such like objects, thou wilt understand that the life which they have, they have not of themselves, but of the spirit which thou seest not, and which alone quickens them. Thou mayest therefore say, Behold here the true life, from which, in which, and by which, all things live and grow. O oh, living joy of this heart! So at the sight of brute animals, thou wilt raise thy thoughts to God, who gave them feeling and motion, saying, O thou first mover of all that moveth, thou art thyself immovable. How do I rejoice in thy firmness and durability? And if allured by the beauty of the creature, separate that which thou seest from the spirit which thou seest not, and consider that all which appears beautiful outwardly springs only from the invisible spirit which is the source of that outward beauty, and say joyfully, Behold, these are streamlets from the uncreated fountain. Behold, these are drops from the infinite ocean of all good. Oh, how does my inmost heart rejoice at the thought of that eternal, infinite beauty which is the source and origin of all created beauty? And on discovering in others goodness, wisdom, justice, or similar virtues, make the same separation in thy mind, and say to thy God, O most rich treasure house of all virtues, how greatly do I rejoice, that from thee, and through thee alone, flows all goodness, and that in comparison with thy divine perfection is as nothing. 
i thank thee lord for this and for every other good gift which thou hast vouchsafed to my neighbour remember lord my poverty and my great need of this very virtue in stretching out thy hand to do anything reflect that god is the first cause of that action and thou but his living instrument raising thy thoughts to him say thus how great is my inward joy supreme lord of all that without thee i can do nothing and that thou art indeed the first and chiefest worker of all things when eating or drinking consider that it is god who makes thy food pleasant to thee delighting thyself therefore in him alone thou mayest say rejoice o my soul that as there is no true contentment but in thy god so in him alone mayest thou in all things delight thyself if thy senses are gratified by some sweet odour rest not in this enjoyment but pass on in thought to the lord from whom this sweetness is derived and inwardly comforted by this thought thou wilt say grant o lord that like as i rejoice because all sweetness flows from thee so may my soul stripped and bared of all earthly pleasure ascend on high as a sweet savour acceptable unto thee when thou hearest any harmony of sweet sounds let thy heart turn to god and say how do i joy o my lord and my god in thy infinite perfections which not only produce a supercelestial harmony in thine own self but also unite in one harmonious marvellous concert the angels the heavens and all created beings end of chapter twenty one chapter twenty two of the spiritual combat this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Spiritual Combat by Lorenzo Scupoli. Chapter 22. How the same things are to us, the means of regulating our senses, and of leading us on to meditate on the incarnate word in the mysteries of his life and passion i have shown thee above how we may raise our minds from sensible objects to the contemplation of the divinity now learn a way of taking occasion from the same to meditate on the incarnate word and reflect on the most sacred mysteries of his life and passion all things in the universe may serve to this end if as i said before thou wilt view god in them as the sole first cause who has given them all the being and beauty and excellence which they possess thence passing on consider how great how immeasurable is his goodness who being the sole principle and lord of all creation was pleased to descend so low as to become man to suffer and die for man permitting the very works of his hands to arm themselves against him and crucify him many things then will bring these holy mysteries before the eyes of the mind such as arms cords scourges pillars thorns reeds nails hammers and other instruments of his passion poor hovels will recall to our memory the stable and the manger of our lord rain will remind us of the drops of divine blood which fell from his most sacred body in the garden and watered the earth the rocks which we see will represent to us those which were rent asunder at his death the earth will bring to remembrance the earthquake at that hour the sun the darkness which then covered it the sight of water will speak to us of that stream which issued from his most sacred side the same may be said of other like things let the taste of wine or other liquid remind thee of thy lord's vinegar and gall if sweet perfumes refresh thee think of the ill savour of the dead bodies which he smelt on calvary when clothing thyself recollect that the eternal word clothed himself with human flesh that he might clothe thee with his divinity when unclothing thyself remember christ who was stripped of his garments to be scourged and crucified for thee if thou hear the shouts and cries of the multitude think of those hateful voices away with him away with him crucify him crucify him which resound in his divine ears as often as the clock strikes think of that deep sorrow and heaviness of heart which jesus was pleased to endure in the garden as the fear of his approaching death and passion began to fall upon him 
or picture to thyself those heavy blows which nailed him to the cross on any occasion of grief or sorrow which presents itself whether thine own or another's reflect that all these things are as nothing compared to the inconceivable anguish which pierced and wrung the soul and body of thy lord End of chapter 22chapter twenty three of the spiritual combat this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org the spiritual combat by lorenzo scupoli chapter twenty three of other means whereby to regulate our senses according to the different occasions which present themselves having now seen how to raise the mind from sensible things to the contemplation of the divinity and of the mysteries of the incarnate word i will here add some helps for various subjects of meditation that as the tastes of souls are many and various so also may be the nourishment thereof this may be useful not only to simple-minded persons but also to those of loftier minds and more advanced in the spiritual life who nevertheless may not at all times be equally disposed and ready for higher contemplations nor hast thou any reason to fear perplexity from the variety of the methods described if thou wilt only observe the rule of discretion and attend to the advice of others which not in this instance only but on all occasions i desire thee to follow with all humility and confidence on beholding so many things which are pleasing to the sight and prized on earth consider that all these are vile as dust compared to heavenly riches after which do thou despising the whole world aspire with undivided affections when looking towards the sun reflect that thy soul is brighter and more beautiful than it if it be in favour with thy creator that otherwise it is blacker and more hateful than the darkness of hell when raising thy bodily eyes to the heavens above thee let those of thy mind pierce even to the heaven of heavens and there fix thyself in thought as in the place prepared for thy eternal and blessed abode if thou shalt live holily upon earth on hearing the songs of birds or other melodious sounds lift thy heart to the songs of paradise where resounds a never-ending alleluia and pray the lord to make thee worthy to praise him together with those heavenly spirits for ever and ever if thou art conscious of taking delight in the beauties of the creature remember that there lies hid the deadly serpent ready and eager to slay or at least to wound thee and say to him o oh, accursed serpent how wily dost thou wait to devour me then turning to god say blessed be thou o oh my god who hast discovered to me the hidden enemy and delivered me from his devouring jaws then fly at once from the enticement to the wounds of the crucified saviour letting thy mind rest in them considering how acutely thy lord suffered in his most sacred flesh to free thee from sin and to make all carnal delights hateful to thee i would remind thee of another way of escape from this perilous enticement namely to consider well what will be after death the condition of that object which now so delights thee when walking remember that every step brings thee nearer unto death let the flight of birds and the flowing of water remind thee that thy life is hastening to its close with much greater swiftness let stormy winds lightning and thunder remind thee of the tremendous day of judgment and kneeling down worship god and pray to him to give thee time and grace to prepare thyself duly to appear then before his most exalted majesty in the variety of accidents which may befall thee exercise thyself thus when for example thou art oppressed by sadness or melancholy or sufferest heat cold or the like lift up thy heart to that eternal will which for thine own good willeth that at such a time and in such a measure thou shouldest feel this discomfort then rejoicing at the love which thy god shows thee and at the opportunity of serving him in the way he is pleased to appoint say in thine heart behold in me the fulfilment of the divine will which hast lovingly ordered from all eternity that i should now endure this trial 
all praise be to thee my most gracious lord for the same when any good thought arises in thy mind turn instantly to god and referring it to him give him thanks for it when reading behold thy lord in the words and receive them as coming from his divine lips when looking upon the holy cross consider that it is the standard of thy warfare that by forsaking it thou wilt fall into the hands of cruel enemies but by following it thou wilt attain unto heaven laden with glorious spoils when thou seest churches thou mayest amid other devout reflections consider that thy soul is the temple of god and therefore as his dwelling place thou oughtest to keep it pure and spotless when thou beholdest a picture of the virgin mary thank god that she was ever ready to do the will of thy god that she brought forth and nourished the redeemer of the world and adore in amazement the ineffable mystery of god made man let pictures of the saints represent to thee so many champions who having so courageously run their course have opened a way for thee in which if thou wilt press onward thou also shalt with them be crowned with immortal glory when the clock strikes be it to you as the voice of god telling you that the world is passing away and that the word of god alone abideth for ever and in him he who doeth his will that another hour is taken from the sum of thy life and pray thy saviour for mercy at the hour of death or thank him for his grace hitherto and pray for perseverance through the day or gird thyself anew to act as thou wouldest were this thy last hour or think of some mystery of the hour or repeat some brief aspiration which thou hast chosen for the day especially the third sixth and ninth hours that is nine twelve three have been from the first allotted to prayer that while we are perhaps intent upon other business and might forget our duties toward god the very hour when it comes may put us in mind thereof the worshippers of god spiritually appointing of old these spaces of time observe them as their fixed and lawful seasons for prayer a mystery of the trinity which in the latter days should be revealed for from the first hour to the third is a trinity of number from the fourth to the sixth is another trinity and in the seventh closing with the ninth a perfect trinity is numbered in spaces of three hours so that our very life by these divisions is a continual memory and worship of the ever-blessed trinity and how can we do less than three times in the day at least besides morning and evening which will invite us to prayer of themselves fall down and worship the blessed trinity father son and holy ghost thus when the clock strikes nine think that at that hour the holy spirit descended on the disciples fulfilling the gracious promise of the lord and pray come holy ghost our souls possess with thy full flood of holiness when it strikes twelve worship him who then hung upon the cross for thee and cleanse thy sins with his blood pray him who for thy salvation stretch forth his arms upon the cross to receive thee within the arms of his mercy when it strikes three remember how he then for thy redemption and quickening made victory perfect by his passion and commended his spirit into the hands of his father and pray him for grace to follow his death and to receive thee to life at sunrise since christ is the true sun and the true day pray him light from light unfailing ray day creative of the day truest sun upon us flow with thy calm perpetual glow at sunset pray for that coming of christ which will give to us the grace of light eternal the red sun is gone thou light of the heart blessed three holy one to thy servants a son everlasting impart and to express briefly the method by which thou must regulate thy senses be watchful so that in all things and under all circumstances thou be moved and drawn not by hatred or love of them but by the will of god alone loving and hating only what god wills thee to love and hate and observe that i have not given the above methods for regulating the senses that thou mightest dwell upon them for thy mind should almost always be fixed upon thy lord who wills that by frequent acts thou shouldest apply thyself to conquer thine enemies and thy sinful passions 
both by resisting them and by making acts of the contrary virtues i have taught them thee that thou mayest know how to rule thyself when needful for thou must know that there is little fruit in using many spiritual exercises however excellent in themselves nay this very often leads to perplexity of mind self-love unsteadfastness and the snares of the devil end of chapter twenty three chapter twenty four of the spiritual combat this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. the spiritual combat by lorenzo scupoli chapter twenty four of the way to rule the tongue it is very necessary that the tongue be well ruled and bridled because every one is much disposed to let it run on and discourse upon those things which are most pleasing to the senses much speaking springs commonly from pride we persuade ourselves that we know a great deal we take delight in our own conceits and endeavor by repeating them needlessly to impress them on the minds of others that we may exercise lordship over them as though they needed instruction from us it is not possible to express in few words the many evils which arise from overmuch speaking talkativeness is the mother of sloth the sign of ignorance and folly the door of slander the minister of lies the destroyer of fervent devotion a multitude of words adds strength to evil passions by which the tongue is more easily led on to indiscreet talking do not indulge in long conversations with those who are unwilling to hear thee lest thou weary them nor with those who love to listen to thee lest thou exceed the bounds of modesty avoid loud and positive speech which is not only odious in itself but is also a sign of presumption and vanity never speak of thyself or thy doings nor of thy kindred but in cases of absolute necessity and then with all possible reserve and brevity if others seem to speak overmuch of themselves try to give a good meaning to their conduct but do not imitate it even though they should speak in a humble and self-accusing way speak as little as may be of thy neighbor or of anything that concerns him unless an opportunity offers to say something good of him speak willingly of god and especially of his love and goodness but with fear and caution lest even here thou fall into error rather take pleasure in listening while others speak of him laying up their words in the depth of thine heart let the sound of men's voices strike only upon thine ear do thou meanwhile lift up thy heart to the lord and if thou must needs listen to their discourse in order to understand and reply to it yet neglect not to cast thine eye in thought to heaven where thy god dwelleth and contemplate his loftiness as he ever beholds thy vileness let the things thy heart suggests thee to say be well considered before they pass on to the tongue for thou wilt perceive that it would be well to keep back many of them and i still further assure thee that not a few even of those which thou wilt then think it well to speak would be far better buried in silence and so thou wilt perceive upon reflection when the opportunity for speaking is past silence my daughter is a strong fortress in the spiritual combat and a sure hope of victory silence is the friend of him who distrusts himself and trusts in god it is the guard of holy prayer and a wonderful help in the practice of holiness in order to accustom thyself to silence consider frequently the evils and perils of talkativeness and the great benefit of silence love this virtue and in order to acquire the practice of it occasionally keep silence even at times when thou mayest lawfully speak provided this be not to the hurt of thyself or others and to attain this it will greatly help thee to withdraw from society for in the place of men thou wilt have the society of angels of saints and of god himself lastly remember the combat which thou hast in hand that seeing how much thou hast to do thou mayest the more willingly refrain from all needless words end of chapter twenty four
Chapter 25 of The Spiritual Combat. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Spiritual Combat by Lorenzo Scupoli. Chapter 25 that in order to fight successfully against his enemies, the soldier of Christ must avoid, as much as possible, all perturbations and disquiet of mind. As we should do our utmost to recover our peace of mind when we have lost it, so must we learn that there is nothing which ought to take it away or even disturb it. We have indeed good reason to mourn over our own sins, yet with a quiet sorrow, as I have shown above more than once so also without disquiet, but with a holy feeling of charity, should we pity all other sinners, and weep at least inwardly over their offenses. As to other sad and trying events, such as sickness, wounds, or death of nearest relations, pestilence, fire, war, or such like evils, though these, being painful to nature, are for the most part shunned by the men of this world, yet may we, by the grace of God, not only will them, but even love them, as just punishments for the wicked, and opportunities of virtue to the good. For on these accounts, our Lord God himself takes pleasure in them, and we, uniting our will with his, shall pass with a calm and quiet spirit through all the bitterness and crosses of this life, and be assured that all disquiet is displeasing in his sight, for be it what it may, it is never free from imperfection, and always springs from some evil root of self-love. Keep therefore a guard, ever on the watch, who so soon as he discovers anything to trouble and disquiet thee, may warn thee to take up arms for thy defense. And consider that all these, and such like evils, are not real evils, though outwardly they seem so, nor can they rob us of any real good, but are all ordered or permitted by God for the aforesaid righteous ends, or for others most just and holy, though we think otherwise. So may the most untoward event work for us much good, if we do but keep the soul in peace and quiet, else all our exercises will be of little or no use. Besides, when the heart is disquiet, it is always exposed to manifold assaults of the enemy, and moreover, in such a state, we are not able to see clearly the right path and the sure way of holiness. Our enemy, who above all things, hates this peace, as being the dwelling place of God's Holy Spirit, who works therein great wonders, often under a friendly garb, tries to take it from us by means of sundry desires which have a semblance of good, but their deceitful nature may be known by this token among others, that they rob us of our peace of mind. Therefore, to remedy so great an evil, when the sentinel gives warning of any new desire, do not open the door of thy heart, until, free from all self-will, thou first offer it to God, and confessing thy blindness and ignorance, pray earnestly that by his light he may show thee whether this desire comes from him or from the enemy. Thou shouldest also have recourse, when possible, to the judgment of thy spiritual father. And though the desire should come from God, yet before thou dost act upon it, mortify thy too great eagerness, for a work entered upon after such mortification will be far more acceptable to him than if done with natural eagerness. Nay, sometimes it may be that the mortification will be more pleasing to him than the work itself. In this way, driving from thee all evil desires, and not acting upon the good ones, till thou have first subdued thy natural impulses, thou wilt keep the fortress of thy heart in peace and safety. And in order to keep it in perfect peace, it is also needful to defend and guard it from certain inward self-reproaches and feelings of remorse, which sometimes come from the devil, though they seem to come from God, because they accuse thee of some failing, by their fruits thou shalt know them. If they humble thee, make thee diligent in good works, and do not rob thee of thy trust in God, thou shouldest receive them with thankfulness as from God. But if they confuse thee, and make thee fearful, distrustful, slothful, and faint in good deeds, then be sure that they come from the enemy. Do not listen to them, but go on with thine exercise. And moreover, since disquiet more commonly arises in our heart, 
at the approach of adverse events thou hast two things to do in order to defend thyself against these assaults one is to consider and see whether these events are adverse to the spirit or to self-love and self-will for if they be adverse to self-will and to self-love thy chief and greatest enemy then thou shouldest not call them adverse but deem them special favors and helps from the most high god to be received with a joyful heart and with thanksgiving and though they be adverse to the spirit thou must not therefore lose thy peace of mind as i will teach thee in the following chapter the other is to lift up the mind to god accepting all things blindly from the pitiful hand of his divine providence as being full of manifold blessings which thou as yet knowest not and seeking to know nothing further end of chapter twenty five chapter twenty six of the spiritual combat this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the spiritual combat by lorenzo scupoli chapter twenty six what we should do when we are wounded when thou feelest thyself wounded from having through thy weakness or even at times through wilfulness and with forethought fallen into some sin be not discouraged or disquieted because of this but turn instantly to god and say unto him behold o lord what of myself i have done and what indeed but falls could be expected from me and then after a short pause humble thyself in thine own eyes grieve for having offended thy lord and without confusion be full of indignation against thine evil passions especially against that one which caused thy fall then say nor even here lord should i have stopped if thy goodness had not withheld me and here give him thanks and love him more than ever wondering at his great mercy in that when thou hadst so offended him he stretched out his right hand to save thee from another fall lastly say with full trust in his infinite mercy forgive me lord for thine own sake suffer me not to depart from thee nor to be separated from thee nor evermore to offend thee and this done do not sit down to think whether god has pardoned thee or not for this is nothing else but pride disquiet of mind loss of time and a delusion of the devil under color of various fair pretexts but committing thyself freely to the merciful hands of god go on with thine exercise as if thou hast not fallen and if thou shouldest fall and be wounded many times in the day do what i have taught thee with no less faith the second the third and even the last time than the first and despising thyself and hating the sin more and more strive to live more watchfully this exercise is very displeasing to the devil both because he sees it to be most acceptable to god and because he is confounded at finding himself overcome by one whom before he had conquered and therefore by many deceitful ways does he seek to make us give it up and often succeeds through our carelessness and too little watchfulness over ourselves therefore if this exercise seem very hard to thee so much the greater violence must thou do to thyself renewing it repeatedly even after a single fall and if after a fault thou feel uneasy confused and distrustful the first thing to be done is to recover thy peace and quiet of heart and with it thy confidence also armed with these turn again to the lord for the disquiet thou feelest on account of thy sin comes not from having offended god but from having injured thyself the way to recover this peace is for the time wholly to forget thy fall and to set thyself to meditate on the unspeakable goodness of god how he is beyond measure ready and willing to forgive every sin how grievous soever it be calling the sinner by various ways and means to come to him that he may unite him to himself in this life by his grace to hallow him and in the life to come by his glory to make him blessed eternally and after having quieted thy mind by these or the like reflections turn thy thoughts once more to thy fall doing as i have told thee above again at the time of sacramental confession 
which I exhort thee to frequent often. Call to mind all thy falls, and with fresh sorrow and displeasure for having offended God, and with purpose to do so no more, disclose them with all sincerity to thy spiritual father. End of chapter 26「twenty seven of the Spiritual Combat. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Spiritual Combat by Lorenzo Scupoli. Chapter 27 Of the Means Employed by the Devil to Assail and Deceive Those Who Desire to Give Themselves Up to Holiness and those who are already taken captive in the bondage of sin. Thou must know, dear daughter, that the devil is intent upon nothing but our ruin, and that he does not fight in the same way with all. In order, then, to make known to thee some of his modes of attack, his plans and wiles, I will lay before thee different conditions of men. Some find themselves in the bondage of sin without any thought of getting themselves free. Some wish to be free, but do not begin to try. Others think they are walking in the way of godliness while they are moving away from it. And lastly, some, after having attained to holiness, fall into deeper perdition. We will discourse separately of each. End of chapter 27 Chapter 28 of The Spiritual Combat this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Spiritual Combat by Lorenzo Scupoli. Chapter 28 of the Devil's Assaults and Wiles Against Those Whom He Holds in the Bondage of Sin. When the devil holds a man in the bondage of sin, his chief care is to blind him more and more, and to keep from him every thought, which might lead him to the knowledge of his most miserable life. And not only does he, through contrary thoughts, drive from him thoughts and inspirations which call him to conversion, but by opportunities, ready and prepared for him, he makes him fall into the same, or it may be, into other and greater sins. Hence, as his blindness becomes thicker and darker, he throws himself more headlong and habitually into sin, and thus from blindness to deeper blindness, from sin to fouler sin, his wretched life whirls round, even unto death, unless God, by his grace, provide a remedy. The remedy for one in this most unhappy state is, to be ready on his part, to give heed to the thoughts and inspirations which call him from darkness to light, crying out with all his heart to his creator o oh lord help me make speed to help me leave me not any longer in this darkness of sin and let him not fail to repeat over and over again this cry for mercy in these or the like words if possible let him fly instantly to some spiritual guide and ask help and counsel that he may be delivered from the power of the enemy and if he cannot do this immediately, let him fly with all speed to the crucified, and throwing himself at his sacred feet, with his face to the earth, crave mercy and help. On such like speed depends the victory, as thou wilt learn in the next chapter. End of chapter 28 Chapter 29 of The Spiritual Combat this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Spiritual Combat by Lorenzo Scupoli. Chapter 29 Of the Arts and Wiles by which he holds in bondage those who, knowing their misery, would fain be free, and how it is that our resolves prove so often fruitless. They who, knowing the evil of their course of life, wish to change it, are often deceived and conquered by the devil with the following weapons. Presently, presently, crass, crass, tomorrow, tomorrow, as says the raven. 
i wish first to consider and dispatch this business this perplexity then give myself with greater quiet to things spiritual a snare this in which many men have been and still are caught the cause of this is our own negligence and heedlessness seeing that in a business which concerns the salvation of the soul and the honor of god we do not quickly take up that most powerful weapon now now wherefore presently to-day to-day wherefore to-morrow saying to thyself supposing even this presently and this to-morrow be granted me is it the path of safety and of victory to seek first to be wounded and to commit fresh disorders thou seest then my daughter that in order to escape this snare and the one mentioned in the foregoing chapter and to subdue the enemy the remedy is ready obedience to heavenly thoughts and inspirations ready obedience i say and not mere resolves for these are often treacherous and many have thereby remained deceived through different causes the first as touched upon above is that our resolves are not founded on mistrust of self and trust in god nor does our great pride which causes this delusion and blindness suffer us to see this the light whereby to know it and the help to cure it both come from the goodness of god who suffers us to fall that by the fall he may call us from trust in self to trust in him alone and from our pride to the knowledge of ourselves therefore if thou will that thy resolves take effect they must be brave and they will be so when they have nothing of trust in self and are all founded with humility on the trust in god the other reason is that when we are making our resolves we dwell on the beauty and excellence of virtue which draws to itself our will faint and weak though it be but afterwards on laying before it the difficulty of attaining virtue the will being faint and untried fails and draws back again therefore accustom thyself to love the difficulties which the attainment of virtue brings with it more than the virtues themselves and use these difficulties now in a less now in a greater degree to nourish thy will if thou wouldest indeed attain to holiness and know that the more quickly and firmly thou shalt conquer thyself and thine enemies the more generously wilt thou embrace the difficulties and the dearer will they be to thee the third reason is that our resolves at times aim at our own advantage rather than at holiness and the will of god this is often the case with resolves which are wont to be made in times of spiritual joy or heavy sorrow when we find no other relief than a resolve to will to give ourselves wholly to god and to exercise the virtues that thou mayest not fall into the snare be in times of spiritual delight very cautious and humble in thy resolves especially in thy promises and vows and when in tribulation let thy resolves be engaged about this alone to bear thy cross patiently according to the will of god and even to make it heavier by refusing whatever could lighten it whether of earth or sometimes even of heaven let thy one desire thy one prayer be that god would help thee to bear all adverse things without staining the virtue of patience and without anything unloving toward thy lord End of chapter 29chapter thirty of the spiritual combat this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the spiritual combat by lorenzo scupoli chapter thirty of the delusion of those who think they are going onward to perfection the enemy being now conquered in his first and second attack and device our malignant foe has recourse to the third which is to make us forget the enemies who are in the act of fighting and injuring us and to fill our mind with desires and resolves after high degrees of perfection hence it follows that we are continually wounded yet pay no regard to our wounds and looking upon these resolves as carried into effect we pride ourselves upon them in various ways and while we will not endure the least thing 
or the slightest word which crosses our will we waste our time in long meditations on resolves to bear the sharpest sufferings for the love of god and because the inferior part feels no repugnance to these sufferings as being far off therefore do we miserable creatures persuade ourselves that we are in the rank of those who are indeed patiently enduring great things in order to avoid this snare be resolved and fight against the enemies which are close at hand and are really warring against thee thou wilt thus see clearly whether thy resolves are true or false weak or strong and thou wilt go on unto holiness and perfection by the beaten and royal road but i do not advise thee to take up arms against the enemies who are not wont to annoy thee unless thou foresee that they are likely at some time or other to attack thee in this case it is lawful to make resolves beforehand that thou mayest be then found ready and strong do not however judge of thy resolves by effects even though for a long time thou shouldest have duly exercised thyself in virtues but be very humble in them fear thyself and thine own weakness and trusting in god turn to him in frequent prayer that he may strengthen and guard thee from dangers and especially from the very least presumption and self-confidence for in this case if we cannot wholly conquer certain little faults which the lord sometimes leaves in us in order to a more humble knowledge of self and for the protection of some virtue it is nevertheless lawful for us to form purposes of a higher degree of perfection end of chapter thirty chapter thirty one of the spiritual combat this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the spiritual combat by lorenzo scupoli chapter thirty one of the devil's assaults and devices to draw us away from the path of holiness the fourth device by which as i said before the evil one assails us is the following when he sees us advancing steadily towards holiness he excites in us a variety of good desires that he may lead us from the exercise of virtues into sin a sick person perhaps is bearing his illness with a patient will the cunning adversary knowing that in this way he may gain a habit of patience immediately lays before him all the good works which in a different condition he might be able to do and tries to persuade him that if he were well he would serve god better and be more useful to himself and others having once aroused within him such wishes he goes on increasing them by degrees till he makes him restless at being unable to carry them into effect as he would wish and the deeper and stronger such wishes become the more does this restlessness increase then the enemy leads him on softly and cunningly to impatience under the sickness not as sickness but as a hindrance to those works which the sick man anxiously wishes to do for some greater good when he has brought him so far with the same cunning he removes from his mind the motive of serving god and performing good works leaving him the bare desire to be freed from his sickness if this does not happen according to his wish he is so disturbed as to become quite impatient and thus unknowingly he falls from the virtue in which he was exercising himself into its opposite vice the way to guard against and resist this snare is to be very careful when in any trying state not to give way to desires after any good which being then out of thy power to do would probably disquiet thee in such a case thou shouldest with all humility patience and resignation believe that thy wishes would not have the effect thou didst think inasmuch as thou art more insignificant and unstable than thou thinkest or else believe that god in his secret judgment or on account of thy unworthiness willeth not this of thee but rather that thou abase and humble thyself patiently under the gentle and mighty hand of his will in like manner if hindered by thy spiritual father or by any other reason so thou canst not at will attend thy devotions and especially the holy communion suffer not thyself to be troubled and disquieted by wishing for them 
but stripped of thy whole self clothe thee with the good pleasure of thy lord saying to thyself if the eye of divine providence did not perceive ingratitude and sin in me i should not now be deprived of the blessing of receiving the most holy sacrament but seeing that my lord thus discovers to me my unworthiness forever blessed and praised be his name for this i trust o my lord that in thy infinite loving kindness thou wilt so order my heart that waiting on thee and pleasing thee in all things and disposed to carry every will of thine it may open itself to thee so that thou entering into it spiritually mayest comfort and strengthen it against the enemies who seek to draw it away from thee thus may all be done as seems good in thy sight my creator and redeemer may thy will be now and ever my food and support this only favor do i beg of thee o my beloved that my soul purified and freed from whatsoever displeases thee and adorned with all holiness may be ever prepared for thy coming and for whatsoever it may please thee to do with me if thou wilt observe these instructions know for certain that when hindered in any good which thou hast a desire to do whether this come from nature or from the devil to disquiet thee and turn thee aside from the way of godliness or from god to make proof of thy submission to his will thou wilt still have an opportunity of pleasing thy lord in the way most acceptable to him this is true devotion and the service which god requires of us i warn thee further lest thou grow impatient under trials from whatsoever source proceeding that in using the lawful means which god's servants are wont to use thou use them not with the desire and hope to obtain relief but because it is the will of god that they be used for we know not whether his divine majesty will be pleased by this means to deliver us if thou dost otherwise thou wilt fall into further evils for should the thing not succeed according to thy purpose or desires thou wilt easily run into impatience or thy patience will be defective not wholly pleasing to god and of little worth lastly i would here warn thee of a secret deceit of our self-love which is wont on certain occasions to cover and justify our faults for example a sick man who has but little patience under his sickness conceals his impatience under the veil of zeal for some seeming good saying that his vexation comes not really from impatience under the suffering caused by his illness but is a reasonable sorrow because he has brought it on himself or else because others from the trouble he gives them or from some other causes are enduring weariness and hurt in like manner the ambitious man who frets himself because of some unattained honour does not attribute this to his own pride and vanity but to other causes whereas he knows very well that on other occasions which cause him no discomfort they would give him no concern so neither would the sick man care if they whose trouble and fatigue on his account seem to give him so much vexation should have the same trouble and hurt on account of another's sickness a clear proof that the root of such men's sorrow is not for others or for aught else but an abhorrence of all that crosses their own will therefore lest thou fall into this and other errors always bear patiently as i have told thee any trial and sorrow from whatever cause it may come End of chapter 31chapter thirty two of the spiritual combat this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the spiritual combat by lorenzo scupoli chapter thirty two of the last assault and device above named by which the devil tries to make virtues already acquired the occasion of our ruin the cunning and malignant serpent fails not to tempt us by his artifice even through the very virtues to which we have attained that they may become an occasion of ruin to us while we regarding them and ourselves with complacency lift up ourselves on high thereby to fall afterward into the sin of pride and vainglory to keep thyself from this danger ever fight 
placing thyself in the safe and level field of a true and deep knowledge that thou art nothing that thou knowest nothing that thou canst do nothing and hast nothing but miseries and defects and deservest nothing but eternal damnation and thus secured and fixed within the bounds of this truth suffer not thyself to be drawn out so much as a hair's breadth either by any thought or aught else which may befall thee well convinced that all these are so many enemies who would slay or wound thee shouldst thou fall into their hands that thou mayest exercise thee well in running in the aforesaid field of the true knowledge of thy nothingness use the following rule as often as thou dost reflect upon thyself and thy works behold thyself always with what is thine own not with what is of god and of his grace and so esteem thyself as thou dost find thyself to be with what is thine own only if thou think of the time before thou wert thou wilt see that in all that abyss of eternity thou wast a mere nothing and didst nothing and couldst do nothing towards thy being and now thou hast thy being through the sole goodness of god if thou leave to him his own his continual providence whereby he every moment preserves thee what art thou with all which is thine own but still a mere nothing for there is no doubt that did he for the smallest moment leave thee thou wouldst return in a moment to thy first nothingness whence his almighty hand drew thee it is clear then that in this natural being thou viewed with all which is thine own hast no reason to esteem thyself or wish to be esteemed by others as to the life of grace and the practice of good works what good and meritorious thing could thy nature do of itself being deprived of the help of god for considering on the other hand the number of thy past transgressions and moreover the multitude of other sins from which god's pitiful hand has alone withheld thee thou wilt find that thine iniquities by a multiplication not only of days and years but also of acts and habits of sin for one evil habit draws another after it would have become of almost nameless amount and so made of thee another infernal lucifer hence if thou wouldst not rob god of the praise due to his goodness but cleave faithfully to thy lord thou must learn day by day to think more humbly of thyself and be very careful in this judgment to deal honestly with thyself or it may do thee no little harm for if thou in that thou knowest thine own iniquity art better off than one who in his blindness thinks himself to be something yet thou losest much and makest thyself worse than he in the deeds of the will if thou desire to be esteemed and treated by men as being what thou knowest thyself not to be if then thou desirest that the knowledge of thy sinfulness and vileness should shield thee from thine enemies and make thee dear to god thou must not only despise thyself as unworthy of any good and deserving of all evil but thou must love to be despised by others hating honours rejoicing in shame and stooping on every possible occasion to offices which other men hold in contempt thou must make no account at all of their opinion lest it defer thee from this holy exercise be sure however that thou do this with a view solely to thine own humiliation and self-discipline and not out of a certain lurking pride and presumptuous spirit which oftentimes under some fair pretext make little or no account of the opinion of others and if because of any good which god has bestowed on thee thou shouldst perchance be esteemed or loved or praised by others keep steadily collected within thyself and be not moved one step from the aforesaid truth and justice but turn first to god saying to him with all thy heart o lord may i never take to myself thy honour and thy graces to thee be praise and honour and glory to me confusion of face and then say in thy heart of him who praises thee whence is it that he accounts me good since verily my god alone and his works are good for by acting in this manner and by giving back to the lord that which is his own thou wilt keep thine enemies afar off and dispose thyself to receive greater gifts and favours from god 
and if the remembrance of good works expose thee to any risk of vanity view them instantly not as thine own but as god's and as if addressing them thou mayest say in thine heart i know not how ye had your source and birth in my mind for ye have not your being from me but the good god and his grace created nourished and preserved you him alone then will i acknowledge as your true and first father him will i thank and to him will i give all the praise consider next that not only do all the works which thou hast done fall short of the light which has been given thee to know them and the grace to execute them but also that they are very imperfect and but too far removed from that pure intention and due diligence and fervor with which they should be done and which should ever accompany them if then thou wilt well consider this thou wilt see reason rather for shame than for vain complacency because it is but too true that the graces which we receive pure and perfect from god are stained in their use by our imperfections further compare thy works with those of the saints and other servants of god for by such comparison thou wilt clearly see that thy best and greatest are of base alloy and of little worth next measure them by those which christ wrought for thee in the mysteries of his life and of his continual cross consider them apart from his divine person in themselves alone how fervent and how pure was the love with which they were wrought and thou wilt see all thy works are indeed as nothing and lastly if thou wilt raise thy thoughts to the divinity and the boundless majesty of thy god and the service which he deserves thou wilt see plainly that not vanity but great fear remains with thee from all thy works therefore in all thy ways in all thy works however holy they be thou must cry unto thy lord with all thine heart saying god be merciful to me a sinner further i would advise thee to be backward in making known the gifts which god may have bestowed on thee for this is almost always displeasing to thy lord as he himself plainly shows us in the following lesson appearing once in the form of an infant to one of his pure and devoted creatures she asked him with great simplicity to recite the angelic salutation he readily began hail mary full of grace the lord is with thee blessed art thou among women and then stopped being unwilling to praise himself in the words which follow and while she was praying him to proceed he withdrew himself from her leaving his servant full of consolation because of the heavenly doctrine which by his example he had thus revealed to her do thou likewise my daughter learn to humble thyself acknowledging thyself with all thy works to be the very nothing that thou art this is the foundation of all other virtues god before we existed created us out of nothing and now that through him we do exist he wills that the whole spiritual building should be built on this foundation that is the knowledge that of ourselves we are nothing and the deeper we advance in this knowledge the loftier will be the building and in proportion as we dig up the earth of our wretchedness so will the number of solid stones which the divine architect will lay to advance the building and do not persuade thyself my daughter that thou canst ever dig deep enough on the contrary believe this of thyself that if anything belonging to a creature could be infinite such would be thy vileness with this knowledge if duly practised we possess all good without it we are little better than nothing though we do the works of all the saints and be continually absorbed in god o oh, blessed knowledge which makes us happy on earth and glorious in heaven o oh, light which issuing from darkness makes the soul bright and clear o oh, unknown joy which sparkles amid our impurities o oh, known nothingness which makes us lords of all i should never be weary of speaking of it to thee if thou wilt praise god accuse thyself and desire to be reproached by others humble thyself with all and beneath all if thou wouldst exalt him in thee and thyself in him wouldst thou find him exalt not thyself or he will fly from thee 
humble thyself to the utmost, and he will seek thee and embrace thee. And he will receive thee and embrace thee the more lovingly, the more thou abasest thyself in thy own sight, and the more thou delightest to be esteemed vile by others, and to be spurned as a thing abominable. Account thyself unworthy of so great a gift, bestowed upon thee by thy God, who suffered shame for thee, in order to unite himself to thee. Fail not to return him continual thanks for it, and hold thyself obliged to those who have given thee occasion to humble thyself, and still more to those who have trampled upon thee, and who think, moreover, that thou endurest it with ill, not with good will. Even were this so, yet shouldest thou show no sign of it outwardly. If, notwithstanding these many considerations, which are but too true, the subtlety of the devil, and our own ignorance, and evil inclinations yet prevail within us, so that thoughts of self-exultation cease not to disquiet us, and make an impression on our hearts, then is the time to humble ourselves the more in our eyes. For we see by this proof that we have advanced but little in the spiritual life, and in the true knowledge of self, seeing that we cannot free ourselves from those annoyances which spring from the root of our empty pride. So from the poison we shall extract honey and healing from the wounds. End of chapter 32 Chapter 33 of The Spiritual Combat This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Spiritual Combat by Lorenzo Scupoli Chapter 33 some advice how to conquer evil passions and acquire fresh virtues. Though I have said so much to thee of the way by which thou must conquer thyself and adorn thee with holiness, there still remain other points whereof to warn thee. First, in thine endeavors after holiness, never be persuaded to use those spiritual exercises which appoint different virtues for different days of the week. But let this be the order of thy warfare and of thine exercise to combat those passions which have always injured thee, and still often assault and injure thee, and to adorn thyself with opposite virtues, and this as perfectly as possible. For in gaining these virtues, thou wilt with ease and with few acts, readily gain all others as their occasions offer, and occasions will never be wanting, inasmuch as all the virtues ever go united together in one band, and he who possesses one in perfection has all the others ready waiting at the door of his heart. Secondly, never set a fixed time for attainment of virtues, neither days nor weeks nor years, but as one newly born, as a soldier yet untried, fight thy way, and go forward to the height of their perfection. Do not stand still, even for a moment, for to stand still in the way of holiness and perfection is not to take breath or courage, but to fall back, or become weaker than before. By standing still, I mean making ourselves believe that we have gained the virtue perfectly, and at times, taking less heed of the occasions, which call us to new acts of that virtue, or of little failings therein. Therefore be careful, be fervent, be watchful, that thou neglect not the slightest opportunity for the exercise of any virtue. Love all occasions which lead to it, and especially those which are most difficult, seeing that habits are more quickly formed and more deeply rooted, the greater the difficulties to be overcome. Therefore love those which offer thee such difficulties. Flee those only, and that with rapid step, with all speed and diligence, which may lead thee to the temptation of the flesh. Thirdly, be prudent and discreet in those virtues which may hurt the body, such as self-chastisement by means of disciplines, hair cloths, fasts and vigils, meditations and the like, for these must be attained slowly and by degrees, as will be presently explained. As to other virtues, holy inward, such as the love of God, contempt of the world, self-abasement, hatred of sin and of sinful passions, meekness and patience, love towards all men, towards those who injure us and such like, it is not necessary to attain these little by little, nor to mount by degrees to perfection in them, but strive to make each act as perfect as possible. 
fourthly let thy whole thought thy desire thy heart think of nothing desire nothing long for nothing but to conquer that passion with which thou art struggling and to acquire its opposite virtue be this all thy world thy heaven thy earth thine every treasure and all in order to please god whether eating or fasting laboring or resting watching or sleeping at home or abroad whether engaged in devotion or in the works of thy hands do all with a view to overcome and subdue this passion and to gain the opposite virtue fifthly be thou the enemy of earthly pleasures and comforts altogether and so will all vices have little power to assail thee for they all spring from the one root of pleasure therefore when this is cut away by hatred of self they lose their strength and power for if on the one hand thou wilt fight against some particular sin or pleasure and on the other give thyself to other earthly enjoyments though they be not mortal but venial hard will be the battle bloody doubtful and rare the victory therefore keep ever in mind these divine words he that loveth his life shall lose it and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal the gospel of john chapter 12 verse 25 brethren we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh for if ye live after the flesh ye shall die but if ye through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the body ye shall live letter to the romans chapter 8 verses 12 and 13 sixthly and lastly i warn thee that it would be well and perhaps necessary for thee to make first a general confession doing everything which belongs to that duty that thou mayest be better assured of thy lord's favor to whom alone we must look for all graces and victories end of chapter thirty three chapter thirty four of the spiritual combat this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org the spiritual combat by lorenzo scupoli chapter thirty four virtues are to be acquired gradually by exercising ourselves in several degrees of them and giving our attention first to one and then to another though the true soldier of christ who aspires to the height of perfection should set no bounds to his progress still there are some degrees of spiritual fervor which require to be bridled with a certain discretion lest being at first embraced with too much warmth they should afterwards fail and leave us in the midst of our race hence besides what has been said as to moderation in outward exercises it is well to know that even inward virtues should be attained by degrees and little by little for thus that which is small soon becomes great and lasting for example we should not as a rule practice ourselves in rejoicing in afflictions and wishing for them till we had first passed the lower degrees of the virtue of patience neither do i advise thee to attend mainly to all or to many virtues at once but to one only and afterwards to the others thus will the virtuous habit be more easily and firmly planted in the soul for by the constant exercise of one single virtue the memory recurs to it more readily on all occasions the intellect becoming gradually more quickened to discern new ways and reasons for attaining to it and the will inclines to follow it more easily and lovingly than if occupied with many virtues at one and the same time and by means of this uniform exercise the acts which bear upon a single virtue are done with the less toil through the likeness between them the one calls to and helps its like and by this likeness again they make a greater impression upon us the ground of the heart being prepared and disposed for receiving the new seed by having already afforded room for the like fruits these reasons have the greater force as we know for certain that whoever exercises himself well in one virtue learns at the same time the way to exercise himself in another and thus all grow together with the increase of one because they are inseparably joined together as being rays proceeding from one and the same divine light end of chapter thirty four
Chapter 35 of The Spiritual Combat. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Spiritual Combat by Lorenzo Scupoli. Chapter 35 of the means whereby virtues are acquired and how we should make use of them by attending for some space of time to one virtue only for the attainment of holiness besides all that has been said above we need a great and generous soul a will not faint nor remiss but firm and resolute with a firm conviction that we must pass through many rough and adverse trials besides this there are particular inclinations and affections which we may acquire by often considering how pleasing they are to god how excellent and noble in themselves and how useful and necessary to us since from them all perfection has its source and end let there be made each morning firm resolves to exercise ourselves in them according to the things which are likely to happen through the day and during it we should many times examine ourselves to see whether we have kept these resolves or not renewing them afterwards with fresh life and all this especially concerning the virtue then in hand likewise let the examples of the saints and our prayers and meditations on the life and passion of christ so necessary in every spiritual exercise be all applied chiefly to that very virtue in which we are then exercising ourselves let the same be done on all occasions as we shall presently show more particularly how different in their kind they may be let us try so to use ourselves to inward and outward acts of virtue that we may come to do them with the same readiness and ease as before we did others pleasing to our natural will and as we said elsewhere the more contrary such acts are to that will the more quickly will they bring the good habit into our soul the sacred words of holy scripture said with the voice or at least with the mind as may best suit us have a wonderful power to help us in this exercise to this end let there be many such in readiness concerning the virtue we are to practise and let them be said through the day especially when the contrary passion rises as for instance if we are trying to get patience we can say the following words or others like them my children suffer patiently the wrath that is come upon you from god baruch chapter four verse twenty five the patient abiding of the meek shall not perish for ever psalm nine verse eighteen he that is slow to anger is better than the mighty and he that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh a city. Proverbs chapter 16 verse 32. In your patience possess ye your souls. The Gospel of Luke chapter 21 verse 19. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Letter to the Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1. To the same end, we may likewise say the following or such like short prayers when my god shall this heart of mine be armed with the shield of patience when shall i to please my lord bear every trouble with a quiet mind o oh, most dear sufferings which liken me unto my lord jesus crucified for me soul life of my soul shall i ever for thy glory live contented amidst a thousand agonies happy shall i be if in the midst of the fire of tribulation i burn with desire to endure greater things we may use these short prayers and any others suited to our progress in holiness which will teach the spirit of devotion these short prayers are called ejaculatory because they are like darts jaculated or darted towards heaven they have great power to rouse us to virtue and to penetrate even to the heart of god if as by two wings they are accompanied by two things the one is a true knowledge that our exercise of holiness is pleasing to our god the other a true and burning desire to acquire it for this end only to please his divine majesty end of chapter thirty five chapter thirty six of the spiritual combat this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Spiritual Combat by Lorenzo Scupoli. Chapter 36 that in the exercise of virtue we must walk in continual watchfulness of things most important and necessary to attain holiness besides those taught above one is that to arrive at each virtue which we set before us we must ever be going onwards else by only standing still we are turning back for when we leave off acts of virtue it follows of necessity that through the violent inclination of the senses and of other things which move us outwardly many unruly passions are formed within us which destroy or at least lessen holiness and moreover we lose many gifts and graces with which our lord might have rewarded our farther progress therefore is the spiritual journey different from that of the earthly traveller for in the earthly journey nothing of the ground already gained is lost by standing still it is in the heavenly and moreover the weariness of the earthly pilgrim increases as the body moves on whereas in the spiritual journey the farther one walks onwards the more vigor and strength he gains for by the practice of virtue the soul's inferior part which by resisting made the way rough and wearisome gets weaker and weaker while the superior part where virtue abides gets firmer and stronger hence as we advance in holiness the pain which we felt lessens and a certain secret gladness which by the working of the spirit is mingled with that pain increases ever more and more in this way ever going on with greater ease and delight from virtue to virtue we reach at last the mountain top where the perfected soul works on without weariness nay with pleasure and rejoicing because having now conquered and subdued its unruly passions and standing above all created things and itself it lives happily in the heart of the most high and there sweetly working takes its rest end of chapter thirty six chapter thirty seven of the spiritual combat this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Spiritual Combat by Lorenzo Scupoli. Chapter 37. That as we must always continue in the exercise of all virtue, so must we not shun any opportunity which presents itself for their acquisition we have seen clearly enough that in the journey which leads to perfection we must ever walk on without stopping to this end we should be very careful and watchful not to lose any opportunity of gaining any virtue therefore they are much mistaken who remove themselves as much as possible from such contrary things as might lead to them for keeping to my wonted example if thou wouldest gain the habit of patience it is not well to withdraw from such persons deeds or thoughts as tempt thee to impatience therefore thou needest not shun the society of any because it is tiresome to thee but in thine intercourse and dealings with whatever annoys thee keep thy will always disposed and ready to bear any trouble and discomfort which may come of it else thou wouldest never get the habit of patience in like manner if any work be irksome to thee either in itself or because of the person who laid it on thee or because it hinders thee from doing something thou wouldest like better still undertake it and go on with it though it disquiet thee and though thou mightest find peace by not doing it because thou wouldest not in this way learn to suffer nor would thy peace be true peace as it comes not from a soul freed from passion and adorned with holiness i would say the same of vexing thoughts which at times may trouble and disturb thy mind thou needest not drive them altogether from thee for besides the pain they give thee they also teach thee to bear contradictions and whoever tells thee differently would teach thee rather to shun labor than to follow after the virtue which thou desirest it is very true that the young soldier especially ought to skirmish and shield himself with watchfulness and skill on such occasions now facing now turning from them as he gains more or less spiritual strength 
yet he must never quite turn his back and withdraw so as to leave all opportunity of contradiction behind because though for the time we might be saved from the danger of falling we should for the future run a greater risk when exposed to assaults of impatience from not having first armed and strengthened ourselves with the practice of the contrary virtue this advice however applies not to the sins of the flesh of which we have already spoken more particularly End of chapter 37 chapter 38 of the spiritual combat this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the spiritual combat by lorenzo scupoli chapter 38 that we should highly cherish all opportunities of fighting for the acquisition of virtues and chiefly those which present the greatest difficulties it is not enough dear daughter that thou shouldest use the opportunities given thee of acquiring virtue i would have thee at times seek them as things of great price and value and always embrace them joyfully so soon as they come to thee counting those most dear and precious which are most unpleasing to thee this by the grace of god thou wilt do if thou wilt fix in thy mind the following considerations one is that opportunities are fitting nay necessary means of acquiring virtues hence when thou art asking virtues of the lord thou art also of necessity asking opportunities else would thy prayer be vain and thou wouldst be contradicting thyself and tempting god who does not usually give patience without tribulation nor humility without humiliations and the same may be said of all the other virtues which are doubtless gained by means of crosses and the more painful these are the more they help us and therefore the more dear and welcome should they be to us for acts of virtue done at such times are more noble and more full of earnestness and open the path to holiness more easily and quickly even the slightest opportunity though but a word or a look against our will should be prized and used for acts so made are more frequent though less intense than those made in great difficulties the other consideration of which i have already spoken is that every opportunity which befalls us comes from god for our good and that we may profit by it and though as we have said elsewhere some of these such as our own failings or those of others cannot be said to be of god who willeth not sin yet are they from him in that he permits them and though able to hinder them hinders them not but all the sorrows and afflictions which come to us either through our own fault or the malice of others are both from god and of god because he allows them and that which he would not have us do as being full of evil exceeding hateful in his pure eyes he wills that we suffer both for our good and for otherwise reasons hidden from us being then well assured that our lord wills us to bear gladly any cross which may come to us either from others or from our own evil deeds to excuse our impatience by saying as many do that god wills not nay abhors evil deeds is but a vain pretext to hide our own faults and refuse the cross which we know it is his pleasure we should bear nay i will say farther that all things considered our lord loves better to see in us patience under those troubles which come from the wickedness of men especially if we have served and benefited them than under those which come from other grievous accidents and this because our proud nature is mostly more humble by the former than by the latter and also because by suffering them with good will we do above measure please and magnify our god working together with him in that wherein his unspeakable goodness and almightiness shine forth most brightly namely in drawing out the deadly poison of malice and wickedness the sweet and precious fruit of holiness and virtue know then dear daughter that so soon as the lord beholds in us a lively desire to do it in earnest and give ourselves as we ought to so great a work he makes ready a cup of the strongest temptations and hardest trials that we may take it in his time 
and we acknowledging his love and our own good should receive it blindly and willingly and drink it trustingly and readily to the very dregs for it is a medicine made up of ingredients the more healthful to the soul as they are more bitter in themselves and prepared by a hand which cannot err end of chapter thirty eight chapter thirty nine of the spiritual combat this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the spiritual combat by lorenzo scupoli chapter thirty nine how we may avail ourselves of various opportunities for the exercise of a single virtue we have seen above that it is better to practice a single virtue at a time than many at once and that we should rule the opportunities we meet with accordingly however varied now learn how this may be done with tolerable ease it may happen that the same day or at the very hour we are reproved for some good action or blamed for some other reason we may be harshly denied some favor we have asked or perhaps some mere trifle we may be unjustly suspected of evil or we may be called to endure some bodily pain or some petty annoyance such as a dish badly dressed or some more heavy distress and harder to be done such as this wretched life is full of may befall us though in the variety of these or the like accidents we may perform various acts of virtue yet if we would keep to the rule laid down we shall continue to exercise ourselves in acts wholly conformable to the virtue we have in hand at the time as for example if when these opportunities present themselves we are exercising ourselves in patience we shall bear them all willingly and with gladness of heart if our exercise be that of humility we shall in all these little crosses acknowledge ourselves to be deserving of every possible ill if of obedience we shall submit ourselves at once to the almighty hand of god and to please him since he so wills it to created things rational and even inanimate that may have caused us these annoyances if of poverty we shall be well content to be stripped and deprived of all consolation great or small if of charity we shall bring forth acts of love both towards our neighbor as the instrument of good to us and towards our lord god as the first and loving cause whence proceed these annoyances or by whom they are permitted for our exercise and spiritual improvement from what has been said of the various accidents which may befall us every day we may also understand how during a single trial of long continuance such as sickness or other like affliction we may yet go on performing acts of that virtue in which we are then exercising ourselves End of chapter thirty nine chapter forty of the spiritual combat this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the spiritual combat by lorenzo scupoli chapter forty of the time to be given to the exercise of each several virtue and of the signs of our progress the time to be given to the exercise of each several virtue is not for me to determine this must be regulated by the state and needs of each person by the progress they are making in their spiritual course and by the judgment of their spiritual guide but if we set ourselves faithfully to work in the manner and with the diligence i have described there is no doubt but that in a few weeks time we shall have made no little progress it is a sign of progress and holiness if amid dryness and darkness and anguish of soul and the withdrawal of spiritual joys we go on firmly in our exercises of virtue another clear sign will be the degree of resistance made by the senses to the performance of acts of virtue for the weaker this resistance the greater our advancement when then we cease to feel any contradiction and rebellion in the lower and sensual part 
and especially in cases of sudden and unexpected attacks, we may look upon this as a token of having already attained to the virtue. And the greater the readiness and gladness of spirit which accompanies these acts, the greater profit we may hope to have derived from this exercise. I warn thee, however, that we should never assume, as a certainty, that we have attained to any virtue, or entirely subdued any one passion, even though for a long time, and after many struggles, we may not have felt its motions. For here also, the artifices and workings of Satan, and our own deceitful nature, may find a place. Since oftentimes, that which is vice, seems to our lurking pride, like virtue. Besides, if we look to the perfection to which God invites us, we shall hardly persuade ourselves, however great the progress we have made in the way of holiness, that we have even entered upon its threshold. Therefore, as a young soldier, and, as it were, a newborn babe, just beginning to struggle, do thou return continually to thy first exercises, as though thou hast hitherto done nothing." And remember, my daughter, to attend rather to advancement in holiness than to an examination of thy progress. For the Lord God, the true and only searcher of our hearts, gives this knowledge to some and withholds it from others, according as he sees that it will lead to pride or to humiliation. And like a loving father, he removes a danger from one, while to another he offers an opportunity of increasing in holiness." Therefore, though the soul perceive not her own progress, let her still continue these, her exercises, for she shall see it when it pleases the Lord to show it to her for her greater good. End of chapter 40 Chapter 41 of The Spiritual Combat This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Spiritual Combat by Lorenzo Scupoli. Chapter 41. That we must not yield to the wish of being delivered from the trials we are bearing patiently, and of the way to regulate all our desires, so as to advance in holiness. When thou findest thyself in any trial, however painful, and bearest it with a patient spirit, take heed lest the devil, or thine own self-love, persuade thee to wish to be delivered from it, for thereby two great evils might befall thee. One is, that if this wish did not at once rob thee of the virtue of patience, it would at least gradually dispose thee to impatience. The other, that thy patience would become defective, and would be recompensed by God, only according to the duration of the suffering. Whereas, if thou hast not desired to be freed from it, but hadst given thyself wholly to his divine goodness, thy suffering, though but an hour's length, nay, even less, would have been owned by thy Lord as a long enduring service. In this, then, and in all things, make it a general rule, to keep thy wishes so far removed from every other object, that they may aim simply and solely at its true and only end, that is, the will of God. For in this way will they be well ordered and righteous, and thou, in any contrary event whatsoever, wilt be not only calm, but contented, for as nothing can happen without the supreme will, thou, by willing the same, wilt come at all times, both to will and to have, all that happens and all that thou desirest. This, which must not be understood either of our own or other sins, because God wills them not, applies to every chastisement arising from these or other causes, though it be so severe and searching as to reach the bottom of the heart and to dry up the roots of the natural life, for this is the very cross with which it pleases God to favor sometimes his nearest and dearest friends. And what I say of the patience which thou must have in all cases is to be understood also of that portion of any trouble which yet remains and which God wills us to bear, even after we have used all lawful means to be freed from it. And even these means should be ruled by the disposal and will of God, who has ordained them to be used, not to please ourselves, but because he so wills it, 
nor as loving or desiring deliverance from suffering beyond what his service and will require. End of chapter 41. Chapter 42 of The Spiritual Combat. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Spiritual Combat by Lorenzo Scupoli. Chapter 42 How to Resist the Devil When He Seeks to Deceive Us by Means of Indiscreet Acts of Devotion. When the wily devil perceives that we are walking straight forward in the path of holiness with fervent and well-ordered desires, being unable to draw us aside by open deceits, he transforms himself into an angel of light, and by friendly suggestions, quotations from scripture, and examples of the saints, importunately urges us to walk indiscreetly in the height of perfection, that so he may cause us thence to fall headlong. To this end, he encourages us to chastise the body with great severity, by disciplines, abstinences, hair cloths, and other like mortifications, that he might either tempt us to pride by thinking we are doing great things, as is especially the case with women, or that we may, by some sickness, be unfitted for good works, or else, that from over-weariness and pain, spiritual exercises may become wearisome and distasteful to us, and thus by little and little we grow lukewarm in godliness, and at last give ourselves up with greater eagerness than before to worldly pleasures and amusements. This has been the end of many, who, following presumptuously the impulse of an indiscreet zeal, have, in their excessive outward endurances, gone beyond the measure of their own virtue, and so have perished in their own inventions, and become the sport of malicious fiends. This would not have befallen them had they well considered what we have been saying and remembered that this kind of painful acts, though praiseworthy and profitable to those who have corresponding strength of body and humility of spirit, must yet be tempered to each man's state and condition. And to those who cannot labor with the saints in this roughness of life, there will not be wanting other opportunities of imitating their life, by strong and effectual desires and fervent prayers, aspiring to the most glorious crowns of Christ's true soldiers, by despising the whole world and themselves also, by giving themselves up to silence and solitude, by meekness and humility towards all men, by patient suffering under ills, by doing good to those most disagreeable to them, and by keeping themselves from every fault, however trifling. For this is a thing more acceptable to God than painful bodily exercises. With regard to these, I advise thee to be rather discreetly sparing, so as to be able, if needs be, to increase them, than by certain excesses to run the risk of being compelled, at last, to give them up altogether. I say this, being well persuaded that thou art not likely to fall into the error of some, who, though they pass for spiritual persons, are yet allured and deluded by deceitful nature, into an over-anxious care for the preservation of their bodily health. So jealous and careful are they of it, that for the most trifling reason, they are always in doubt and in fear of losing it. There is nothing of which they think more, and speak more willingly, than of the ordering of their lives in this respect. Hence they are ever careful to have food suited rather to their taste than to their stomach, which is often enfeebled by over-delicacy. And whereas this is done under the plea of being able to serve God better, it is but a vain wish to unite two deadly enemies, the spirit and the flesh, an attempt which benefits neither, nay, injures both. For this same over-carefulness impairs the health of the one and the devotion of the other. Therefore, a certain freedom in our way of life is, in all respects, safer and more profitable, not unaccompanied, however, by the discretion of which I have spoken, having regard to different constitutions and conditions of life, which cannot all be subjected to the same rule. I would say further, that not only in outward things, but also in acquiring inward holiness, 
we should proceed with some moderation as has been shown above as the gradual acquiring of virtues end of chapter forty two chapter forty three of the spiritual combat this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the spiritual combat by lorenzo scupoli chapter forty three of the power of our own evil inclinations and the instigations of the devil to incline us to form rash judgments of our neighbors and of the way to resist this temptation from the above-mentioned vice of self-esteem and self-conceit arises another which is in the highest degree hurtful to us that is rash judgment of our neighbor which leads us to despise disparage and lower him and as this fault springs from pride and evil inclination so is it by the same pride willingly cherished and nourished for as it increases so does pride also increase insensibly humoring and deceiving us since the more we presume to exalt ourselves so much the more do we unconsciously depreciate others fancying ourselves free from those imperfections which we think we discover in them and the wily devil who perceives in us this most evil disposition of mind is constantly on the watch to open our eyes and keep them awake in order to see examine and exaggerate the failings of others careless men know not and believe not how busy and diligent he is in impressing on our minds the little defects of this or that person when he cannot prevail on us to notice great faults therefore if he be on the watch to do thee hurt be thou also awake lest thou fall into his traps and as soon as he brings before thee any failing of thy neighbor reject the thought at once and if thou still feel tempted to pass judgment upon it yield not consider that this power has not been given thee and that even if it had been thou wouldst be unable to form a right judgment beset as thou art by a thousand passions and but too much disposed to think evil without just cause but as an effectual remedy against this fault i would remind thee to occupy thy thoughts with the defects of thine own heart for thou wilt hourly perceive more and more that thou hast so much to do and work in thyself and for thyself as to have neither time nor inclination to attend to the deeds of others besides by performing this exercise faithfully thou wilt be enabled to cleanse thine inward sight more and more from the bad humours whence proceeds this pestilent vice and know that when unhappily thou thinkest any evil of thy brother some root of that same evil is in thine own heart which in proportion as it is ill disposed readily receives any like object which it meets with therefore whenever it comes into thy mind to judge others for some fault be wroth against thyself as guilty of the same and say in thine heart how is it that i wretched being buried in this and far heavier faults dare to lift up my head to see and judge the faults of others and thus the weapons which directed against others would have wounded thee being used against thyself will bring healing to thy wounds for if the error committed be clear and open excuse it with a feeling of pity and believe that there are in thy brother some hidden virtues to guard which the lord permits him to fall or to retain a while this failing that he may be more vile in his own eyes and by being also despised by others for it he may reap the fruit of humiliation and make himself more acceptable to god and so his gain become greater than his loss and if the sin be not only open but grievous and out of an obstinate heart turn thy thoughts upon god's awful judgments here thou wilt see that men who were once most wicked have attained to high degrees of holiness and others who seem to have attained the highest state of perfection have fallen into the most miserable perdition therefore always stand in fear and trembling for thyself more than for any other and be very sure that all good and kindly feeling towards thy neighbor is the gift of the holy spirit and all contempt rash judgment and bitterness towards him 
comes from our own evil and from the suggestions of satan if then any imperfection in another have made an impression on thee rest not give no sleep to thine eyes until to the utmost of thy power thou have effaced it from thy heart end of chapter forty three chapter forty four of the spiritual combat this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the spiritual combat by lorenzo scupoli chapter forty four on prayer if distrust of self trust in god and spiritual exercises be as needful in this combat as has been shown above needful above all is prayer the fourth weapon before mentioned by means of which we may obtain not only those already named but all other good things from the lord our god for prayer is the instrument for obtaining all the graces which stream down upon us from that divine fount of goodness and love by prayer if thou use it well thou wilt put a sword into the hand of god that he may fight and conquer for thee and to use it well thou must be or strive to be well exercised in the following practices first there must ever live within thee an earnest desire to serve his divine majesty in all things and the way most acceptable to him in order to kindle this desire within thee consider well that god is supremely worthy to be served and honored for his excellencies wonderful above all wonders his wisdom goodness majesty beauty and his other infinite perfections that to serve thee he toiled and suffered three and thirty years binding up and healing the putrefying sores envenomed by the poison of sin not with oil or wine or linen but with the precious stream that flowed from his most sacred veins and with his most pure flesh torn by scourges thorns and nails and consider further the great value of this service for by it we gain the mastery over ourselves and satan and are made sons of god himself secondly thou must have a lively faith and confidence that the lord will give thee all things needful for his service and thy good this holy confidence is the vessel which divine mercy fills with the treasures of his grace and the larger and more capacious it is the richer will our prayer return into our bosom for how should the unchangeable and almighty god fail to make us partakers of his gifts when he has himself commanded us to ask for them promising to give us his spirit also if with faith and perseverance we ask for it thirdly thou must draw nigh to prayer with the intention to will god's will alone and not thine own as well in asking as in obtaining what thou askest that is thou must dispose thyself to prayer because god wills it and desires to be heard in so far as he wills it in short thine intention should be to unite thy will to the will of god and not to draw god's will to thine and this because thy will being infected and spoilt by self-love very often errs and knows not what it asks but the divine will is always united to ineffable goodness and can never err therefore is the will of god the rule and ruler of all other wills and deserves and wills to be followed and obeyed by all thou shouldest therefore always ask such things as are conformable to god's will and if thou doubt whether any be so ask it on the condition of willing it if the lord wills thee to have it and such things as thou knowest to be pleasing to him as are virtues thou wilt ask for rather in order to serve and please him than for any other end or motive though spiritual fourthly in going to prayer thou must be adorned with works corresponding to thy petitions and after thou hast prayed labor the more earnestly to fit thyself for the grace and virtue thou desirest for the exercise of prayer must be so accompanied by the exercise of self-mastery that the one may revolve round the other else to ask for a virtue and not exert oneself to obtain it would be rather tempting god than otherwise fifthly thy petitions must be preceded for the most part by thanksgivings for blessings received in this or the like form 
O Lord, who thy goodness has created and redeemed me, and times without number, unknown to myself, hast delivered me out of the hands of my enemies, help me now, and deny me not my request, though I have been ever rebellious and ungrateful unto thee. And if thou art asking for some special virtue, and hast at that time some occasion of painful exercise in it, do not forget to thank God for the opportunity he has given thee, for this is no small loving kindness on his part. Sixthly, because prayer draws its force and power of bending God to our desires from the bounty and mercy of his own nature, and from the merits of the life and passion of his only begotten Son, and from the promise which he has made to hear us, thou wilt end thy petitions with one or more of the following short sentences. O Lord, grant me this grace of thy great mercy. May the merits of thy Son obtain for me that which I ask of thee. Remember thy promises, O my God, and incline thy ear to my prayers. Seventhly, thou must go on perseveringly in prayer, because humble perseverance conquers the unconquerable. For if the importunity and assiduity of the widow in the gospel incline to her request, the judge laden with all iniquity. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 18. How should a like perseverance fail to incline to our petitions, God, who is himself the fullness of all goodness? And though, after thou hast prayed, the Lord delay to come and hear thee, nay, though he even seem to reject thee, still pray on, and hold fast a firm and lively trust in his help, for in him there are not wanting, nay, there abound in boundless measure all things needful to create graces in others. Therefore, if the fault be not on thy side, doubt not but that thou shalt always obtain all that thou askest, or something else more useful to thee, or it may be both one and the other. And the more he seems to repulse thee, the more do thou humble thyself in thine own eyes, and reflecting on thy unworthiness, with steadfast thought of the mercy of God, strengthen more and more thy trust in it, which if thou keep lively and sound, the more it is assailed, the more acceptable will it be to thy Lord. Then give him thanks always, acknowledging him to be good and wise and loving, no less when some things are denied thee than if they were granted thee. Happen what may, remain thou ever steadfast and joyful in humble submission to his divine providence. End of chapter 44「what constitutes mental prayer? Mental prayer is a lifting up of the mind to God in actual or virtual supplication for what we desire. The actual is, when with words within the mind, we ask for the grace in this or such like manner. O oh Lord my God, give me this grace for thine honor. Or, O oh Lord, I believe it to be pleasing unto thee and for thy glory, that I should ask and receive this grace of thee. Fulfill then thy divine will in me. When actually assaulted by enemies, pray after this manner. Be ready, O oh my God, to help me, that I yield not to my enemies. Or, My God, my refuge, the strength of my heart, help me quickly that I fall not. And if the conflict continue, do thou also go on praying in this way, always manfully resisting him who fights against thee. When the sharpness of the war is over, turn to thy Lord, present before him the enemy that has assailed thee, and thy faintness in resisting him, and say, Behold, Lord, the creature of thy bounty, the work of thy hands, redeemed with thy blood, Behold thine enemy, who strives to rob thee of it, and to devour it. To thee, my God, do I fly. In thee alone do I trust, who art all-powerful and good, and seest my weakness, 
and my proneness without thy help to become a willing captive help me then my hope and the strength of my soul by virtual supplication i mean lifting up the mind to god to obtain some grace showing him our need of it without further speech or discourse as when i lift up my mind to god and there in his presence acknowledge that i am unable to shield myself from evil or do good and burning with desire to serve him humbly and in faith awaiting his help i behold and contemplate him the lord such an acknowledgment kindled with desire or faith towards god is a prayer which virtually asks for what i need and the more clear and sincere the acknowledgment the more burning the desire the more lively the faith the more effectual will be the prayer there is another sort of virtual prayer more condensed made by a mere glance of the mind to god to obtain his help which glance is nothing but a silent remembrancer and entreaty for that grace which we have before prayed for and thou shouldest diligently learn this kind of prayer and become familiar with it because as experience will show thee it is a weapon of unspeakable value and help which thou mayest easily have in hand at all times and on all occasions End of chapter forty five chapter forty six of the spiritual combat this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the spiritual combat by lorenzo scupoli chapter forty six of prayer by means of meditation if thou desire to pray for a certain space of time half an hour or perhaps a whole hour or more thou wilt add to prayer a meditation on the life and passion of jesus christ always applying his actions to that virtue which thou desirest thus if thou desire to obtain the virtue of patience thou wilt perhaps take for the subject of thy meditation some points in the infliction of the scourging first how after the command given by pilate our lord was dragged amid scoffs and cries by the ministers of wickedness to the place appointed for his scourging secondly how he was stripped by them with headlong fury so that his most pure flesh was left naked and exposed thirdly how his innocent hands were made tight with hard cords and bound to the pillar fourthly how his whole body was torn and gashed with the scourges so that rivers of his divine blood flowed down to the ground fifthly how by repeated stripes on the same place the anguish of the wounds already inflicted was still more aggravated having thus proposed to thyself these or similar subjects of meditation in order to acquire patience thou wilt first apply thy senses to feel as deeply as possible the most bitter anguish and acute pains which thy dear lord endured in each part of his most sacred body and in every part of it at once thence thou wilt pass on to his most holy soul as far as thou canst enter into the patience and meekness with which he bore so many afflictions which yet could not satisfy his longing desire to suffer even greater and more excruciating tortures for his father's honour and our good then behold him inflamed with an ardent desire that thou shouldest will to bear thy trouble and see how he still turning to the father prays for thee that he would deign to give thee grace patiently to bear the cross which is then tormenting thee and any other which may be laid upon thee hence bowing thy will again and again to will to suffer all with a patient spirit after this turn thy mind to the father and having first thanked him for having out of his pure charity sent his only begotten son into the world to bear such bitter torments and to pray for thee then ask of him the virtue of patience through the works and prayers of his beloved son End of chapter forty six chapter forty seven of the spiritual combat this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Spiritual Combat by Lorenzo Scupoli. Chapter 47 of Another Way of Praying by Means of Meditation. Thou mayest also pray and meditate in another way. After thou hast well considered the sorrows of the Lord and meditated upon the willing spirit with which he bore them, thou wilt pass on from the greatness of his travail and of his patience to two other considerations. The one of his merit, the other of the satisfaction and glory of the eternal father through the perfect obedience of his son in his passion. And representing these two things to his divine majesty, thou wilt ask through them the grace which thou desirest. And this thou mayest do, not only in each mystery of the Lord's passion, but in each particular act, both inward and outward, done by him in each mystery. End of chapter 47「Chapter 48 of the Spiritual Combat. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Spiritual Combat by Lorenzo Scupoli. Chapter 48 of Meditation on Christ's Passion in Order to Excite Various Affections in the Soul. What I have said above concerning the Lord's Passion relates to prayer and meditation by way of petition. I will now show how we may thence draw forth divers affections. Thou dost purpose, for example, to meditate on the crucifixion. In this mystery thou mayest dwell, among other points, upon the following. First, how, when the Lord was furiously stripped on Mount Calvary by that frenzied multitude, his flesh, which through the scourgings he had endured, adhered to his garments, was torn in flakes. Secondly, how the crown of thorns was torn off his head, and being again pressed down upon it, wounded him afresh. Thirdly, how with the strokes of a hammer and with nails, he was cruelly fastened to the cross. Fourthly, how his sacred limbs, which could not reach the holes made to receive the nails, were stretched by these cruel dogs so violently that the dislocated bones might be told one by one. Fifthly, how, as the Lord hung upon the hard wood, supported only by the nails, the weight of his body, bearing downwards, enlarged his most sacred wounds and aggravated their inexpressible agony. Desiring then, by these or other points, to excite in thyself the affection of love, strive by meditation upon them, to pass from knowledge to deeper knowledge of thy Lord's infinite goodness and love towards thee, who for thee willed to suffer so much. For the more thou dost advance in this knowledge, the more will thy love increase. And this knowledge of the goodness and infinite love shown thee by the Lord will easily lead thee to contrition and grief, for having so often and so ungratefully offended thy God, who for thine iniquities was in so many ways ill-used and tortured. To lead thyself to hope, consider that into this state of extreme misery did so mighty a Lord descend, that he might destroy sin, and deliver thee from the snares of the devil, and of thine own special faults, that he might propitiate his eternal Father in thy behalf, and give thee confidence to fly to him in thine every need. Joy will be awakened by passing from his sufferings to their effects, that is, that by these he taketh away the sins of the whole world, a piece of the Father's wrath, confounds the prince of darkness, slays death, and fills again the angelic ranks. And be further moved to gladness because of the joy whereby imparted to the most holy trinity, together with the church triumphant and militant. To rouse thyself to hatred of thy sins, apply every point of thy meditation to this sole end, as if the Lord had suffered for no other purpose, save to teach thee to hate thine evil inclinations, and especially that one which most rules thee, and is most displeasing to his divine goodness. To move thee to wonder, consider what greater marvel can there be than to behold the creator of the universe, who giveth life to all things, persecuted unto death by his creatures, his supreme majesty trampled upon and abased, 
God's justice condemned, his beauty despised, the love of the heavenly father hated, that inward and inexpressible light brought under the power of darkness. Glory and blessedness itself accounted the dishonor and scandal of mankind, and sunk into the extremest misery. In order to feel with thy suffering, Lord, besides meditating upon his outward agonies, thou must, in thought, penetrate into those untold, unexampled sufferings which tortured him inwardly. For if thou grieve for the former, it were a marvel if thy heart break not with anguish at the thought of the latter. The soul of Christ beheld the divine essence, as it now beholds it in heaven, knew it to be beyond measure, worthy of all honor and service, and through his unspeakable love for it, longed that all creatures should, with all their powers, be occupied therein. To see it then, on the contrary, so strangely outraged and dishonored by the numberless sins and abominable iniquities of men, pierced him at one and the same moment with infinite pangs of grief, which tortured him the more in proportion to the greatness of his love and desire that all men should honor and obey so exalted a majesty. And as the greatness of this love and desire are beyond our understanding, even so, none can ever know how heavy and bitter was the inward sorrow of the crucified Lord because of this. Furthermore, as he loved all creatures with a love unspeakable, so in proportion to that love, did he grieve beyond measure for all their sins, by which they were about to separate themselves from him. He grieved for every mortal sin which had been, or which should be committed by all men who had ever lived, or ever should live upon earth. For every such sin, whensoever committed, separates the sinner's soul from the soul of the Lord, to which it was united by love. A separation this more painful than the dislocation of bodily members, inasmuch as the soul being a pure spirit, and more noble and perfect than the body, is therefore more capable of suffering. Amid all these sufferings for his creatures, the most bitter was that which the Lord endured because of all the sins of the damned, who, as they could never more be reunited to him, were to suffer torments eternal and beyond comparison. And if the soul, touched by these sufferings of her beloved Savior, will enter still more deeply into the contemplation of them, she will find deep cause for compassion in the heavy sorrows endured by him, not only for sins actually committed, but also for sins never committed. For without doubt, both the pardon of the former and preservation from the latter have been purchased for us by our Lord at the price of his precious sufferings. Nor will other considerations, my daughter, be wanting to bring thee to sympathize in the passion of the crucified. For there never has been, nor will be, grief of any kind, endured by any reasonable being whatsoever, in which he himself has not felt. Insults, temptations, infamy, penance, every grief and trouble of the whole race of man, crucified the soul of Christ more sharply than the souls of those who suffered them. For all their afflictions, both great and small, of body and soul, even to a slight headache or a prick of a needle, were perfectly seen by our most pitiful Lord, who of his boundless charity was pleased to compassionate them and engrave them in his heart. But who can tell his anguish of spirit at the sorrows of his most holy mother? For in every way and in every respect, in which the Lord sorrowed and suffered, did the Holy Virgin also sorrow and suffer most bitterly, though less intensely. And these, her griefs, opened afresh the inward wounds of her blessed Son. These, like so many fiery darts of love, pierced his most loving heart, which, by reason of all the tortures above named, and of others, infinite in number, yet hidden from us, may be well described, as a devout soul was wont with holy simplicity to call it, a loving hell of voluntary pains. If thou, my daughter, consider well the cause of all this anguish, borne by our crucified Redeemer and Lord, thou wilt find none other but sin only. Hence it plainly follows, that the true and chief sympathy and gratitude which he requires of us, and which we are unspeakably bound to render to him, are, to mourn over our offenses purely for love of him, 
to hate sin with a deadly hatred and to fight bravely against all his enemies and our own evil inclinations that so putting off the old man with his deeds we may put on the new and adorn our souls with evangelical virtues end of chapter forty eight chapter forty nine of the spiritual combat this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. The Spiritual Combat by Lorenzo Scupoli. Chapter 49 Of the Profit to be Derived from Meditation on the Crucified and of the Imitation of His Holiness. Among many other lessons to be learned from this holy meditation, one is, not only to sorrow over thy past sins, but also to grieve for the disorderly passions still alive within thee, which have nailed thy lord to the cross another to ask pardon for thy sins and grace to loathe thyself that thou mayest never more offend him but in return for his many sufferings for thee love and serve him henceforth perfectly which without this holy hatred of self thou wilt be unable to do the third effectually to persecute unto death each one of thy evil inclinations how small soever it may be the fourth to strive with all thy might to imitate the holiness of the saviour who suffered not only to redeem us by making atonement for our iniquities but also to set us an example to follow his holy steps here i would propose to thee a method of meditation which may serve to this end wouldst thou then for example acquire patience in order to imitate christ thy lord consider the following points first what the soul of christ crucified did towards god secondly what god did towards the soul of christ thirdly what the soul of christ did towards itself and towards his most holy body fourthly what christ did towards us fifthly what we should do towards christ first then consider how the soul of christ intent wholly upon god was amazed to see that infinite incomprehensible greatness compared with which all created things are as a mere nothing, subjected to endure on earth the most unworthy treatment, yet still abiding immovable in its glory, and this for man, from whom it has never received aught but unfaithfulness and insults. Consider how his soul adored God, gave him thanks, and offered itself wholly unto him. Secondly, behold attentively what God did towards the soul of Christ, how he willed and impelled it to endure for our sake buffetings spittings blasphemies scourgings thorns and the cross making known his pleasure to see it loaded with every kind of grief and ignominy thirdly pass on to the soul of christ and think how perceiving with its understanding which is light itself how great was this good pleasure of god and with its affection which is fire itself loving his divine majesty with a boundless love both for his infinite merit and because of its immense obligations unto him and being called by him to suffer for love of us and for our example contented and joyful it disposed itself readily to obey his most holy will and who can fathom the deep longings of that most pure and loving soul thus to suffer it was here as it were in a labyrinth of sorrows ever seeking yet not finding as it would new ways and modes of suffering yet did it freely give its whole self and its most innocent flesh as a prey to wicked men and devils to be dealt with as they would fourthly then look unto thy jesus as he turns his pitying eyes on thee and says behold my daughter whither thy unbridled wishes have carried me because thou wouldst not do a little violence to thyself behold how much and how joyfully i suffer for love of thee and to set thee a pattern of thy true patience by all my griefs i entreat thee dear daughter to bear willingly this cross and any other which may be more pleasing to me leaving thyself wholly in the hands of all the persecutors whom i shall give thee be they ever so vile and cruel against thine honour and thy flesh o oh, didst thou but know the comfort this will give me 
but thou mayest clearly see it in these wounds which i have willed to receive as costly jewels in order to adorn with precious virtues that poor soul of thine which is dear to me beyond what thou canst think and if for this i am brought to such extremity wherefore beloved bride wilt thou not suffer a little in order to satisfy my heart and soothe these wounds caused by thine impatience which grieved me so bitterly yea far more than the wounds themselves fifthly next consider well who it is that thus speaks to thee and thou wilt see that it is christ himself the king of glory very god and very man consider the greatness of his torments and ignominy which would have been unworthy of the vilest criminal behold thy lord not only calm and marvellously patient under all these outrages but rejoicing in them as at his marriage and as a little water does but fan the flame so with the increase of agonies which to his abundant love seemed little did his joy increase and his longing to suffer yet greater ones reflect that thy most merciful lord did and suffer all this not of necessity nor for any benefit to himself but as he has told thee out of his love for thee and that thou mayest exercise thyself after his pattern in the virtue of patience entering then deeply into that which he so wills thee and the pleasure thou wilt give him by exercising thyself in this virtue make acts of burning desire to bear not only patiently but joyfully thy present cross and every other though it were heavier to imitate thy god and the better to console him and placing before the eyes of thy mind his shame and bitterness endured for thee his constancy and patience blush to think thine even the shadow of patience or thy sorrows and thy shame real and fear and tremble lest the least thought of unwillingness to suffer for love of thy lord find even a moment's resting place within thy heart my daughter this crucified lord is the book i give thee to read from it thou mayest draw the true picture of every virtue for it is the book of life which not only by words teaches the understanding but also by its living example inflames the will the whole world is filled with books and yet all put together cannot teach so perfectly the way to acquire all virtues as doth the contemplation of god crucified and know my daughter that they who spend many hours in weeping over our lord's passion and meditating on his patience and then when troubles overtake them are as impatient as if in prayer they had learnt quite a different lesson are like the soldiers of this world who in the tents before the hour of battle promise themselves great things but at the first appearance of the enemy throw down their arms and take flight what can be more foolish and miserable than to behold as in a bright mirror the virtues of the lord to love them and admire them and then when there is the opportunity to practise them wholly to forget and disregard them End of chapter forty nine chapter fifty of the spiritual combat this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the spiritual combat by lorenzo scupoli chapter fifty of the most holy sacrament of the eucharist thus far my daughter i have as thou hast already seen furnish thee with four weapons which thou needest in order to conquer thine enemies and with many directions how to use them well there yet remains one other to lay before thee that is the most holy sacrament of the eucharist for inasmuch as this sacrament is above all other sacraments so is this fifth weapon superior to all the others the four above mentioned derive their value from the merits and grace purchased for us by the blood of christ but this weapon is the very flesh and blood joined to the soul and divinity of christ with the former we fight against our enemies in the strength of christ with the latter we fight against them together with christ and christ fights against them together with us for whoso eateth the flesh of christ and drinketh his blood dwelleth in christ and christ in him 
and seeing that this weapon, even this most holy sacrament, may be taken and used in two ways, that is, sacramentally once every day, and spiritually every hour and moment, thou must not neglect to take it very often in the second way, and always when thou mayest in the first. End of chapter 50「of the Spiritual Combat. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Spiritual Combat by Lorenzo Scupoli. Chapter 51 of the manner in which to receive the most holy sacrament of the Eucharist. We may approach this most divine sacrament for divers ends, to attain which we have different things to do, dividing them into three periods. Before communion, when we are about to communicate, and after communion. Before communion, whatever be our object in receiving it, we must wash and purify ourselves in the sacrament of penance from all stain of mortal sin, if there be any, and with the whole heart's affection, give our whole self, with all our soul, all our strength, and all our powers, to Jesus Christ, and to his good pleasure, since he, in this most holy sacrament, gives us his blood and his flesh, with his soul, his divinity, and his merits. And seeing that our gift is little, nay, nothing compared with his, we should desire to possess all that has ever been offered and given to him by all creatures, earthly and heavenly, in order to offer it to his divine majesty. Wouldst thou then receive it in order to conquer and destroy within thee thine enemies and his? Begin on the eve of thy communion or earlier to meditate on the desire of the Son of God, that in this most holy sacrament thou shouldest give him a place in thine heart, that he may unite himself to thee, and help thee to fight against all thine evil passions. So great and boundless is this desire of our Lord, that no created intellect can understand it. That thou mayest, in some degree, do so, thou wilt fix deeply in thy mind two things. One is, the unspeakable joy of the all-gracious God to dwell with us, for he calls it his delight. The other, his hatred of sin above all things, both as an obstacle and hindrance to his union with us, which he desires so much, and also as being wholly opposed to his divine perfections. For being himself supreme good, pure light, and infinite beauty, he cannot but infinitely hate and detest sin, which is not but darkness, the fault and intolerable stain of our souls. So burning is this hatred of the Lord against sin, that all the works of the Old and New Testament were ordained for its destruction, and above all, those of the most holy passion of his Son, who, as God's enlightened servants have said, would, if needful, expose himself anew to a thousand deaths, in order to destroy in us every fault, even the very smallest. These considerations will enable thee to understand, though very imperfectly, how greatly the Lord desires to enter into thine heart, that he may drive out thence and utterly destroy all his enemies and thine, and so wilt thou be stirred up to an earnest desire on thy part to receive him for the same end. Thus encouraged and inspirited by the hope that thy heavenly captain will come into thee, often call to battle the passion which thou hast undertaken to conquer and repress it, hating it again and again with thy whole will, and making acts of the contrary virtue. This thou shouldest continue to do, both in the evening and the morning, before the most holy communion. Then, when about to receive the most holy sacrament, review briefly all the faults which, since thy last communion, thou hast committed, as though God were not, neither had endured so much for thee in the mysteries of the cross, making more account of a mean pleasure, and of thine own wishes, than of the will of God or his honor, and with shame of thyself and a holy fear, thou wilt sink into thine ingratitude and unworthiness. But reflecting again that the immeasurable deep of thy Lord's goodness calls to the deep of thine ingratitude and faithlessness, 
draw near to him with confidence giving him abundant room in thy heart that he may make himself wholly its master and this thou wilt do when thou hast driven from thy heart all affection whatsoever to the creature closing it fast that none may enter into it but thy lord only when thou hast communicated retire immediately into the secret of thy heart and having first adored him then with all humility and reverence converse in spirit with thy lord saying seest thou o my only good how easily i offend thee and how great power this passion has over me and that of myself i am not able to free myself this fight then is chiefly thine and from thee alone do i hope for victory though i too must needs fight then turning to the eternal father offer to him for a thank offering and for victory over thyself his blessed son whom he has given thee and whom thou hast now within thee attack the passion vigorously in faith awaiting the victory from god who though he seemed to delay for a while will never fail thee if thou on thy part wilt do what thou canst end of chapter fifty one chapter fifty two of the spiritual combat this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the spiritual combat by lorenzo scupoli chapter fifty two how to prepare for communion in order to excite within us the love of god in order to excite thyself to love thy god by means of this super celestial sacrament let thy meditation on the evening before be upon his love to thee how that great and almighty lord not content with having created thee after his own image and likeness and with having sent his only begotten son on earth to suffer during three and thirty years for thine iniquities and to endure the most bitter sorrows and the painful death of the cross for thy redemption was further pleased to leave him with thee for thy food and support in the most holy sacrament of the altar consider well my daughter the inconceivable excellence of this love which renders it perfect and unequalled in all points first if we look at its duration our god has loved us unceasingly and without beginning and as he is eternal in his divinity so is his love eternal whereby before all worlds he determined in his heart to give us his son in this marvellous way rejoicing at this within thyself say with secret joy in that abyss of eternity my littleness was then so loved and prized by the most high god that he thought of me and desired with love unspeakable to give me his own son to be my food secondly all other love how great soever has some bound which it cannot pass but this love of our lord is alone without measure willing therefore to satisfy himself fully he has given his own son in majesty and infinity equal to himself of one and the same substance and nature hence the love is as great as the gift and the gift as great as the love and such the greatness of both that no power of mind can conceive anything greater thirdly neither was god drawn to love us by any force or necessity but his own natural goodness alone moved him to so great and incomprehensible a love towards us fourthly neither could any work or desert of ours have induced this mighty lord to manifest such exceeding love towards our wretchedness but of his free bounty alone has he given himself wholly to us his most unworthy creatures fifthly if thou consider the purity of this love thou wilt see that it is not like worldly love mingled with aught of self-interest for the lord needs not anything of ours being without us most blessed and glorious in himself alone but he pours forth his unspeakable goodness and love upon us not for his benefit but for ours reflecting well upon this thou wilt say in thine heart how is it that so mighty a lord sets his heart upon so vile a creature what wouldest thou o king of glory what dost thou expect from me who am but dust 
i see well o oh my god by the light of thy burning charity that thou hast but one design which discovers to me more plainly the purity of thy love for me for to this end only dost thou give me thy whole self to be my food that i may be wholly changed into thee and this not because thou hast any need of me but that thou living in me and i in thee i may by a loving union become thyself and that of the vileness of my earthly heart there may be made with thee one only divine heart then full of wonder and joy to see thyself so highly prized and loved by god and knowing that he by his almighty love seeks and wills only to draw all thy love to himself withdraw thyself first from all creatures and then from thyself also as being a creature and offer thy whole self as a whole burnt offering to thy lord that henceforth his love alone and his divine pleasure may guide thine understanding thy will and thy memory and rule all thy senses and then perceiving that nothing is so powerful to produce in thee such divine effects as worthily to receive him in the most holy sacrament of the altar to this end open thine heart to him with the following ejaculatory and loving aspirations o oh, super celestial food when will the hour come when with no other fire but that of thy love i may wholly sacrifice myself to thee when when o oh, uncreated love o oh, living bread when shall i live by thee alone for thee alone and to thee alone when my life beauteous blessed and eternal life o oh, heavenly manna when shall i loathing all earthly food desire thee alone feed on thee alone when shall this be o oh, my delight my only good o oh, my loving and almighty lord free now this wretched heart from every attachment and from every evil passion adorn it with thy holiness and with the pure intention of doing all things solely to please thee that so i may open my heart to thee invite thee and with gentle violence compel thee to come in that thou o lord mayest then without resistance work in me all that thou hast ever desired in such loving affections thou mayest exercise thyself in the evening and morning as a preparation for communion then as the time of communion draws near think what it is thou art about to receive the son of god of majesty incomprehensible before whom the heavens and all powers do tremble the holy of holies the spotless mirror and purity incomprehensible in comparison of whom no creature is clean he who as a very worm and the outcast of the people willed for love of thee to be rejected trampled upon mocked spit upon and crucified by the malice and wickedness of men thou art i say about to receive god in whose hand are the life and death of the whole universe think on the other hand that as of thyself thou art nothing and hast by thy sin and wickedness made thyself lower than the vilest and most impure of irrational creatures thou art fit to be the sport and mockery of all the devils in hell that instead of being thankful for such immense and innumerable benefits thou hast in thy wilfulness and caprices despised so mighty and loving a lord and trampled upon his precious blood yet for all this in his abiding love and unchangeable goodness he bids thee to his heavenly table nay at times constrains thee to come to it on pain of death he closes not the door of his pity nor turns away his divine presence from thee though by nature thou art leprous lame diseased blind possessed by devils and hast gone after many lovers this only does he ask of thee first to mourn over thine offence against him secondly above all things to hate sin both great and small thirdly to offer and give thyself up wholly to his will and his obedience and this with the affections always and in act when occasion offers fourthly to hope and firmly believe that he will forgive thee cleanse thee and guard thee from all thine enemies 
Encouraged by this ineffable love of the Lord, thou wilt then draw nigh to communicate with a holy and loving fear, saying, Lord, I am not worthy to receive thee, because of the many, many times I have grievously offended thee, nor have I yet mourned, as I ought, over my offenses against thee. Lord, I am not worthy to receive thee, for I am not perfectly cleansed from all affection for venial sins. Lord, I am not worthy to receive thee, for I have not yet given myself up sincerely to thy love, to thy will, and to thy obedience. O my almighty God, infinite in goodness, for thy goodness and word's sake, make me worthy, that with this faith I may receive thee, O my soul's love. When thou hast communicated, shut thyself up immediately in the secret of thy heart, and forgetting all created things, hold converse with thy Lord in the following or such like form. O highest King of heaven, what has brought thee into me, who am miserable, poor, blind, and naked? And he will answer, Love. And thou in reply wilt say, O uncreated love, O oh, sweet love, what wilt thou from me? And he will say to thee, Nothing but love. I will that no other fire burn upon the altar of thy heart, and in thy sacrifices, and in all thy works, but the fire of my love, which consuming all other love and all self-will, will be a most sweet savor unto me. This I have asked of thee, and still ask, because I desire to be wholly thine, and thou wholly mine. This will never be, till making that entire surrender of thyself, which so delights me, thou art loosed from all love of self, self-opinion, self-will, and self-esteem. I ask thee to hate thyself, that I may give thee my love. I ask thy heart, that it may be united unto mine, which to this end was pierced upon the cross, and I ask thy whole self, that I may become wholly thine. Thou seest that I am of priceless value, yet of my goodness I value myself, but at thy value. Buy me then now, O my beloved, by giving me thyself. I will this of thee, sweet daughter, that thou shouldest will nothing, think nothing, understand nothing, see nothing, but me and my will, that in thee I may with all, think all, understand all, and see all, so that thy nothingness, being absorbed in the depth of my infinity, may be changed into it. So wilt thou be fully happy and blessed in me, and I wholly content in thee. Lastly, thou wilt offer to the Father, his Son, first for a thank-offering, then for thy wants, and those of all the Holy Church, of all belonging to thee, or of whom thou art in any way bound, and for all here below, or departed, in the faith and fear of Christ. And this offering thou wilt make in memory of, and in union with that which he made of himself, when hanging all bleeding on the cross, he offered himself to the Father. In this way thou mayest likewise offer to him all the sacrifices offered on that day throughout the Holy Catholic Church. End of chapter 52. Chapter 53 of the Spiritual Combat. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Spiritual Combat by Lorenzo Scupoli. Chapter 53 of spiritual communion. Though we may not receive the Lord sacramentally more than once a day, yet we may all, as I have said before, receive him spiritually every hour and every moment, unless through negligence or some other fault of ours, he be withdrawn from us. And this spiritual communion will sometimes be more fruitful and dearer to God than many sacramental communions which may fail to be so through the faults of the recipients. As often then, as thou shalt dispose thyself and prepare for such communion, thou wilt find the Son of God ready, with his own hands, to give himself to thee for thy spiritual food. 
as a preparation turn to him with thy whole mind and after a brief review of thy shortcomings mourn with him over thine offences and in all humility and faith beseech him that he would deign to come into thy poor soul with new grace to heal it and strengthen it against the enemy or when about to do violence to thyself or to mortify any one of thine appetites or to do some act of virtue do all with a view to make ready thy heart for the lord who continually asks it of thee and then turning to him invite him earnestly to come with his grace to heal thee and deliver thee from thine enemies that he alone may possess thy heart or else calling to mind thy last sacramental communion say with a kindled heart when o oh my lord shall i receive thee again when o oh when but if thou wouldest prepare thyself and communicate spiritually in a more fitting way on the evening before direct all mortifications acts of virtue and every other good work to this end to receive thy lord spiritually and early in the morning strive to kindle in thy heart a great desire to receive him in order to please him by considering how great is the good and happiness of that soul which worthily receives the most holy sacrament of the altar for in it lost virtues are regained the soul returns to her first beauty and the fruits and merits of the passion of the son of god are communicated to her consider also how pleasing it is to god that we receive this sacrament and have these blessings when this desire is kindled within thee turn to him and say since lord i am not allowed to receive thee sacramentally this day vouchsafe o power and goodness uncreate to forgive me all my faults and heal me that so i may worthily receive thee spiritually now every hour and every day and grant me new grace and strength against all my enemies and especially against that one upon whom for love of thee i am now making war End of chapter 53. Chapter 54 of the Spiritual Combat. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Spiritual Combat by Lorenzo Scupoli. Chapter 54 of thanksgiving since all the good we have and do is of god and from god we are bound to give him thanks for every good exercise and every victory and for all the blessings general and particular which we have received from his pitiful hand and to do this in a fitting manner we must consider the end for which the lord vouchsafes to communicate his graces to us for from this consideration and knowledge we come to learn how God wills to be thanked. And because in every blessing the Lord chiefly designs his own honor and wills to draw us to his love and service, first consider with thyself thus, With what power, wisdom, and goodness has my God bestowed upon me this grace and blessing? Then seeing in thee of thine own there is nothing anything worthy of any blessing, but on the contrary, nothing but unworthiness and ingratitude, thou wilt say to thy Lord with deep humility, How is it that thou, O Lord, deignest to look upon a dead dog, bestowing so many blessings upon me? Blessed be thy name for ever and ever. And lastly, seeing that by the blessing he asks thee to love and serve him, inflame thyself with love towards so loving a Lord, and with a sincere desire to serve him in his way. And to this end, thou wilt also make a full oblation of thyself in the following manner. End of chapter 54 Chapter 55 of The Spiritual Combat This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Spiritual Combat by Lorenzo Scupoli Chapter 55 of Self-Oblation 
two things are necessary in order that thy self-oblation be in all points dear to god one is union with the offerings which christ made to the father the other that thy will be wholly loosed from all attachment to any created thing first thou must know that the son of god when living in this vale of tears offered to his heavenly father not himself only and his works but with himself us also and our works so that our offerings must be made in union with and in dependence upon his secondly consider well before thou offer up thyself whether thy will be bound in any way for if so it must first be loosed from every affection and for this have recourse to god that he with his right hand may free thee so that loosed and free from all things else thou mayest be able to offer thyself wholly unto his divine majesty and be very watchful on this point because if thou offer thyself to god while bound to the creature thou offerest not thine own but that which is another's seeing thou art not thine own but dost belong to those creatures to whom thy will is bound a thing most displeasing to the lord as being a mere mockery hence it is that our often oblations of ourselves to god return to us not only empty and fruitless but we afterwards fall into divers failings and sins we may indeed offer ourselves to god though still attached to creatures but only in order that his goodness may loose us to the end that we may give ourselves up wholly to his divine majesty and to his service and this we should do often and with great affection let then thy oblation be without earthly affection or self-will of any kind looking neither to earthly nor heavenly blessings but only to the will and ordering of god to which thou shouldest submit and sacrifice thyself wholly as a perpetual burnt offering and forgetting all created things saying behold my lord and creator each and all my desires i give into the hand of thy will and thine eternal providence do with me as seemeth good to thee in life and in death and after death as in time so in eternity if thou dost this in sincerity which will be seen when adverse things befall thee thou wilt become a dealer not in earthly but in most blessed and heavenly goods for thou wilt be god's and god will be thine seeing that he ever dwells with those who taking themselves away from all creatures and from themselves give up and sacrifice their whole selves to his divine majesty here then my daughter thou seest a most powerful means of overcoming all thine enemies for if this oblation so unite thee to god that thou dost become wholly his and he wholly thine what enemy or what power can ever hurt thee and when thou wouldest offer to him any of thy works as fasts prayers acts of patience or other good deeds first turn thy thoughts to the offering which christ made to the father of his fasts prayers and other works and in dependence on the worth and worthy of these then offer thine own if thou wouldest offer the works of christ to thy heavenly father for thine offences thou wilt do it in the following manner thou wilt take a general and at times a particular review of thy sins and seeing clearly that it is impossible for thee of thyself to appease the wrath of god or to satisfy his divine justice thou wilt turn to the life and passion of his son meditating upon some one of his works as for example when he fasted prayed suffered or shed his blood thou wilt thereby see that to propitiate the father towards thee and to pay the debt of thine iniquities he offered to him these his works his sufferings and his blood saying as it were behold o eternal father according to thy will i make superabundant satisfaction to thy justice for the sins and trespasses of n may it please thy divine majesty to pardon them and to receive her into the number of thine elect then do thou for thyself offer this same offering and these prayers to the father himself beseeching him through them to forgive thee all thy debts 
and this thou mayest do as thou passest not only from one mystery to another but also from one act of each mystery to another and thou mayest use this mode of oblation not for thyself only but for others also End of chapter fifty five chapter fifty six of the spiritual combat this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the spiritual combat by lorenzo scupoli chapter fifty six of sensible devotion and dryness of spirit sensible devotion is produced sometimes by nature sometimes by the devil and sometimes by grace by its fruits thou wilt discern whence it proceeds for if it be not followed in thee by amendment of life thou hast reason to doubt lest it come from the devil or from nature and yet more if it be accompanied by increased sweetness and attachment and by somewhat of self-esteem when therefore thou feelest thy heart sweetened by spiritual delights do not stand disputing as to whence they come do not dwell upon them, nor suffer thyself to be withdrawn from the knowledge of thy nothingness, but with greater diligence and hatred of self, strive to keep thy heart free from all attachment, even though spiritual, and desire God alone and his good pleasure. For by this means the delight, be it of nature or of the devil, will become to thee of grace. Spiritual dryness may, in like manner, proceed from the three following causes from the devil to make our mind lukewarm and turn it away from spiritual impressions to the business and pleasures of the world from ourselves through our faults our earthly attachments and negligences from grace and to warn us that we be more diligent to forsake every attachment and employment which is not of god and ends not in him or that we may know by experience that all good comes from him or that in future we may the more prize his gifts and be more humble and careful to retain them or to unite us more closely to his divine majesty by the entire surrender of ourselves even in spiritual joys lest our affections being set on them we divide the heart which the lord would have holy for himself or else because for our good he is pleased to see us fight with our whole strength and the use of his grace if then thou feel dry enter into thyself to see through what fault of thine thou hast been deprived of sensible devotion and fight against it not to recover the sensible presence of grace but to rid thyself of that which is displeasing to god and if thou discover not the fault let thy sensible devotion be true devotion which is speedy resignation to the will of god take care however on no account to lay aside thy spiritual exercises but continue them with all thy might however fruitless and insipid they may seem to thee drinking willingly the cup of bitterness which in this dryness the loving will of god holds out to thee and if at times this dryness of spirit be accompanied by such great and thick mental darkness that thou knowest not which way to turn nor what step to take yet be not dismayed but remain solitary and steadfast on the cross far from every earthly pleasure though offered to thee by the world or to the creature conceal thy sufferings from all except thy spiritual father to whom thou wilt reveal them not to lighten thy pain but to learn how to bear them according to the will of god use communions prayers and other exercises not that thou mayest come down from the cross but to receive strength to exalt that cross to the greater glory of the crucified and if through confusion of mind thou canst not meditate and pray as usual meditate in the best way thou canst and that which thou canst not do with the understanding force thyself to do with the will and with the mouth conversing with thyself and with the lord for this will have wonderful effects and thy heart will thus take breath and strength thou mayest then in such a case say why art thou so vexed o my soul and why art thou so disquieted within me o oh, put thy trust in god for i will yet thank him which is the help of my countenance and my god 
why standest thou so far off o lord and hidest thy face in the needful time of trouble forsake me not utterly and calling to mind that sacred teaching which god in time of trouble infused into his beloved sarah the wife of tobias do thou too make use of it saying aloud but whosoever serveth thee knows assuredly that his life if passed in trial will be crowned if in tribulation will be freed and if in chastisement he may fly to thy mercy for thou delightest not in our destruction for thou makest a calm to succeed a storm and after tears and weeping thou infusest joy be thy name o god of israel blessed for ever thou wilt also remember thy christ who in the garden and on the cross was to his great suffering forsaken as regards the senses by his heavenly father and bearing the cross with him say with all thy heart thy will be done so will thy patience and thy prayers make the flames of thy heart's sacrifice to rise up before god leaving thee truly devout true devotion being as i have said a lively and steadfast readiness of will to follow christ with the cross on thy shoulder by whatever way he invites and calls us to himself to desire god for god and sometimes to leave god for god and if many who are striving after the spiritual life and especially women would make this and not sensible devotion the measure of their progress they would not be deceived by themselves nor by the devil nor would they complain uselessly nay ungratefully of so great a gift from the lord but would give themselves up with greater fervor to serve his divine majesty who orders or permits all things for his glory and our good and here again do those women deceive themselves who avoid with fear and caution all occasions of sin yet when at times harassed by horrible impure and frightful thoughts and even by still more fearful visions are confounded and disheartened and think themselves forsaken by god and wholly removed from him not believing it possible that his holy spirit can dwell in a heart filled with such thoughts thus cast down they are ready to despair and leaving all holy exercises to return back into egypt such persons do not rightly understand the favor the lord does them he lets them be assailed by these spirits of temptation to bring them to the knowledge of themselves and that being in need of help they may draw near to him therefore they ungratefully complain of that for which they should thank his infinite goodness what thou shouldest do in such cases is to sink thyself in the consideration of thy perverse inclination which for thy good god would have thee know is ready for every grievous sin and that without his help thou wouldest rush into utter perdition and from this gather hope and confidence that he is ready to help thee since he shows thee the danger and wills to draw thee nearer to himself by prayer and by looking unto him for this then thou shouldest give him most humble thanks and be assured that such spirits of temptation and evil thoughts are better driven away by a patient endurance of the pain and dexterous flight than by a too anxious resistance End of chapter fifty six chapter fifty seven of the spiritual combat this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the spiritual combat by lorenzo scupoli chapter fifty seven of the examination of conscience for the examination of conscience consider three things the falls of the day their cause and the spirit and boldness which thou hast in resisting them and in acquiring the opposite virtues with regard to the falls thou wilt do as i have told thee in the chapter on when we are wounded the cause of these falls thou must strive to subdue and strike to the ground the will to do this and to acquire virtues thou wilt strengthen by distrust of self and trust in god by prayer and by a number of acts full of hatred for the sin and of desire for the opposite virtue distrust the victories thou hast gained and the good works thou hast done 
Moreover, I do not advise thee to think much of them, because of the almost unavoidable danger of at least some hidden motive of vainglory and pride. Therefore, whatever they be, leave them all behind to the mercy of God, and think how much more thou hast yet to do. As to thanksgiving for the gifts and favors which the Lord has bestowed on thee in the course of the day, acknowledge him as the doer of all good, and thank him for having delivered thee from so many open enemies, and still more from the hidden ones, for having given thee good thoughts and occasions of virtues, and for every other blessing which thou knowest not. End of chapter 57 Chapter 58 of The Spiritual Combat This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Spiritual Combat by Lorenzo Scupoli. Chapter 58. How We Must Needs Persevere in This Combat, Ever Fighting, Even Unto Death. Among the other things needful in this combat, one is the perseverance with which we must strive continually to mortify our passions, which in this life never die, but on the contrary, like evil weeds, shoot up every hour. And this is a battle, from which, as it ends only with life, there is no escape, and he who fights not in it is of necessity either taken captive or slain. Besides, we have to deal with enemies who bear us an unceasing hatred, so that from them we can never hope either for peace or a truce, because they slay those most cruelly, who strive most to make friends of them. Thou hast no cause, however, to fear either their power or their number, for in this battle none can be a loser but he who wills it. The whole strength of our enemies is in the hand of the captain for whose honor we have to fight." And not only will he guard thee from all treachery, but he will even fight for thee, and, being mightier than all thine enemies, he will give the victory into thy hands, if thou wilt fight manfully together with him, and trust not in thyself, but in his power and goodness. And if the Lord give thee not so speedy a victory, be not disheartened, but be the more assured, and this will also help thee to fight resolutely that all things which shall befall thee, those even which to thee may seem farthest from, yea, most opposed to thy victory, of which kind soever they be, all will he turn to thy good and profit, if thou wilt but bear thyself as a faithful and generous warrior. Do thou then, dear daughter, follow thy heavenly captain, who for thee hath overcome the world and given death to himself, Apply thyself with a strong heart to this battle, and to the utter destruction of all thine enemies, for if thou leave but one of them alive, he will be as a beam in thine eye, and as a thorn in thy side, to hinder thee in the course of so glorious a victory. End of chapter 58 Chapter 59 of The Spiritual Combat this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Spiritual Combat by Lorenzo Scupoli. Chapter 59. How to Prepare Ourselves Against the Enemies Who Assail Us in the Hour of Death. Though our whole life be a continual warfare on earth, Yet the chief and most memorable struggle is at the last hour of the great passage, for he who falls then rises no more. That thou mayest be well prepared then, thou must manfully fight now in this present time, which is given thee. For he who fights well in life will, by the good habit already acquired, gain an easy victory in the hour of death. Besides this, think often, and with fixed attention, on death, for when it comes upon thee, thou wilt fear it less, and thy mind will be more free and ready for the battle. Worldly men fly from this thought, lest it trouble their pleasure in earthly things, on which they have willingly so set their affections, that the thought of having to quit them gives them pain. Thus their unruly affection, instead of getting weaker, goes on increasing more and more in strength, 
so that the parting from this life and from things so dear to them is unspeakably distressing and often most so to those who have enjoyed them longest the better to help thee in making this important preparation fancy thyself sometimes alone and utterly helpless in the agonies of death and bring before thy mind the following things which are likely to trouble thee at that moment then think over the remedies i shall give thee that thou mayest make the better use of them in that last strait for the blow which can be struck but once should be well practised beforehand lest we commit an error which can never be remedied End of chapter fifty nine chapter sixty of the spiritual combat this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org the spiritual combat by lorenzo scupoli chapter sixty of four assaults of our enemies in the hour of death and first of the assault upon the faith and the way to defend ourselves the chief and most dangerous assaults which our enemies are wont to direct against us in the hour of death are four in number namely temptation of the faith despair vainglory and various illusions of devils transforming themselves into angels of light as to the first assault if the enemy begin to tempt thee with his false arguments withdraw instantly from the understanding to the will saying get thee behind me satan father of lies for i will not even hear thee enough for me to believe as the holy catholic church believes and as far as possible shut out all speculations concerning the faith how fair soever they may seem looking upon them as suggestions of the devil to stir up strife but if not in time to withdraw thy mind resolutely be very strong and steadfast that thou yield not to any reason or authority from scripture which the adversary may bring forward for all will be garbled or misapplied or misinterpreted though to thee it may seem good clear and evident and if the wily serpent asks thee what the catholic church believes make him no answer but perceiving his deceit and that he would at least trap thee in thy words make an inward act of more lively faith or else in order to make him burst with rage answer that the holy catholic church believes the truth and if the evil one ask in return what is truth do thou answer even that which she believes above all ever keep thy heart fixed on the crucified saying my god my creator and my saviour help me speedily and go not from me that i depart not from the truth of thy holy catholic faith and grant that as by thy grace i was born in this faith so in it to thy glory i may end this mortal life end of chapter sixty chapter sixty one of the spiritual combat this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. the spiritual combat by lorenzo scupoli chapter sixty one of the assault of despair and its remedy the second assault by which the perverse devil attempts our utter overthrow is the terror with which he fills us at the remembrance of our sins in order to make us rush headlong into the pit of despair in this danger keep to this certain rule that the thoughts of thy sins are of grace and for thy soul's health when they bring forth humility grief for having offended god and trust in his mercy but when they disquiet thee and make thee distrustful and faint-hearted though they seem to thee true and sufficient to persuade thee that thou art condemned and thy day of salvation past then know that they come from the deceiver humble thyself the more and trust the more in god so shalt thou conquer the enemy with his own weapons and glorify the lord mourn indeed over thine offence against god every time it comes to thy memory but nevertheless ask pardon for it trusting in his passion and i tell thee moreover that though god himself should seem to say to thee 
thou art not of his sheep still on no account must thou let go thy trust in him but say to him humbly thou hast indeed reason o my lord to condemn me in my sins but i have greater reason to hope that in thy mercy thou wilt pardon me save therefore i beseech thee this thy miserable creature condemned indeed by her own sinfulness but redeemed with the price of thy blood i commit myself wholly into thy hands o my redeemer that thou mayest save me to thy glory trusting in thy boundless mercy do with me whatsoever pleaseth thee for thou art my only lord yea if thou slay me yet will i trust in thee End of chapter 61chapter 62 of the spiritual combat this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the spiritual combat by lorenzo scupoli chapter 62 of the assault of vainglory the third assault is that of vainglory and presumption here thou must not suffer thyself in any possible way to be led into the very least complacency in thyself or in thy works let thy pleasure be in the lord alone in his mercy and in the works of his life and passion abase thyself yet more in thine own eyes even to thy last breath and acknowledge god alone to be the author of every good work done by thee which may come to mind fly to him for help yet expect it not for thy merits however many and great be the victories thou hast gained ever stand in holy fear confessing sincerely that all thy labours would be vain if thy god did not gather thee under the shadow of his wings in whose protection alone thou wilt put thy trust if thou would follow this advice thine enemies shall not be able to prevail against thee and so thou wilt open to thyself the road by which to pass joyfully to the heavenly jerusalem End of chapter 62 Chapter 63 of The Spiritual Combat This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Spiritual Combat by Lorenzo Scupoli Chapter 63 of the assault of illusions and false appearances in the hour of death if our obstinate foe who is never weary of troubling us assail thee by false appearances transforming himself into an angel of light nevertheless stand firm and steadfast in the acknowledgment of thy nothingness and say boldly to him return wretched one into thy darkness for i am unworthy of visions nor do i need anything but the mercy of my jesus and even though the visions seem to thee to bear many evident tokens that they come from heaven still refuse them and drive them as far from thee as thou canst fear not lest this resistance founded on thine unworthiness be displeasing to the lord for if the matter be from him he knows well how to make it clear and thou wilt be no loser seeing that he who giveth grace to the humble doth not withdraw it because of acts which spring from humility these are the most common weapons which the enemy is wont to use against us in this last step he tempts each man according to the particular inclinations to which he knows him to be most subject therefore before the hour of the great conflict draws near we should arm ourselves strongly and fight bravely against our most violent passions and those which have the greatest rule over us that the victory may be easier in that hour which snatches from us all future time for preparation or fighting end of chapter sixty three end of the spiritual combat by lorenzo scupoli